version. Oh, thank you. I'm reminded that we have uh, public comment to start the meetings. Um, is anyone here to talk about something other than what's on the agenda that we would like to air? No, thank you, though, Carolyn. Okay, sure. Um, so Carolyn sent around revisions to the sign ordinance, and we talked about this before. I think these revisions are basically her uh, listening to what we discussed and giving us a second round of it. Uh, do we have any thoughts on it now? Well, so um, this actually has been formally introduced. So this is technically the public hearing that's been advertised for. It was advertised to go to city council and the planning board. Um, City Council Subcommittee uh, on um, Community Resources um, had their public hearing on Monday night. And then, plan so this is the official planning board public hearing. And then um, um, once, and, and they made a recommendation Monday you guys hold the public hearing tonight, discuss, and then make a recommendation to council. It will then um, move forward to the former ordinance committee, which is now the legislative committee um, of city council before going back to the full council. So um, this, these are, these two, this week represents the two or has the two public hearing, official public hearings for the um, change. So I can go through a formal presentation um, because it's, you know, we're being um, taped and also there may be someone in the audience who wants to speak to it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'd be happy to do that as soon as I can get the presentation <laughs> um, I don't know why it's not. Sorry. Carolyn, you said Tuesday there wasn't much uh, discussion on the public side? There was no public at all at the hearing. So it was only counselors um, uh, with questions. So, right. And I'm assuming from the timing of when you sent this out that none of the comments that were generated there are in here, that these are really the results of what <coughs> Right, actually I can go over that while I'm pulling this up. The council only had um, um, questions about where, you know, how much outreach we had done, um, particularly to the business community. They did have questions about the, the um, and I'll go through that the residential um, time uh, transition time of 30 minutes. They wanted to know sort of where that came from. It sounded, it seemed like a long time. They didn't really make any recommendation one way or the other. They felt like they wanted to discuss that with the full council on the floor. Um, it sounded like they thought that was a long time, um, but again, didn't make a recommendation. And um, the only, um, the only other item was, oh, there was a question from one of the counselors about whether or not Amherst, Hadley, and East Hampton had any regulations for LED signs. So in the meantime, I've also looked into that, okay. um, that and I can go over that. So I just need to take one second and pull this up on the screen, I'm sorry. 168. Okay, so just to sort of refresh everybody's memory and, and um, about how we got here, um, I want to go over the, the existing sign regulations and historically where they've gone um, from the 1970s, our current regulations, and um, 
the idea of differentiating a little bit more um, clearly between residential and commercial districts and some of the safety and aesthetic issues that came up in your research and staff research that we talked about over the last several months. Um, so off, uh, the, and just to, to reiterate, this ordinance doesn't say anything about billboard, what we call billboard signs, which are off-premise signs, meaning they're mostly on the high, we only allow them on the highway corridors. That is handled in a separate subsection of the sign ordinance. Um, the planning board recommended to city council maybe a year and a half ago already, and the city council adopted a measure that does not allow any LED sign um, panel on billboard signs. So that's already been addressed, so it's not part of this ordinance. Um, the zoning code has had a, a regulations of, relative to flashing lights since about 1975, and it's um, fluctuated back and forth between jurisdiction of the police department and the, and the planning board as to how to regulate the flashing um, flashing sign. So it wasn't, um, back then it wasn't LED technology, but um, uh, currently, and, and the current status is that the police chief is the um, um, person who makes the determination whether a flashing sign, and we've interpreted that more recently as an LED sign that flashes, whether that um, is um, distracting to traffic and is a safety hazard. So it's really sort of ad hoc depending on the situation and there's no um, consistency necessarily about how that might be applied. Um, and it, the current code also allows illumination of all types of signs, either externally illuminated signs, which are coming from outside and pointing on signs, or um, internal illuminated signs, internally illuminated signs, which are typically those box signs that you might see, like this Radio Shack sign is probably a good example, where there are lights <coughs> within and, and um, displays out. Um, and just another point of information, in 2007, we had, um, went through a whole um, revision of the site lighting standards and addressed somewhat the sign lights at that point, but not to the extent of addressing LED type signs, which are the changeable copy, electronic <coughs> messaging signs with changeable copy. Um, currently, we do have a distinction by district uh, for the size and the number um, and the type of signs that um, one can have. So in the business district, you can have wall signs. You can also have signs on the ground. So if you look at and you see there's a, this um, on King Street, Honda has a ground sign and then they also have wall signs. Um, we, a, and you can have much larger signs in the commercial district. In the residential districts, there are limited ground signs allowed. So the bottom pictures are examples of um, uh, churches or religious institutions and other institutional uses like community or civic parks, schools and the like can also have ground signs. Those are the only uses that are allowed in the residential district where you, uh, a ground sign can be installed. And, and um, wall signs are limited to mixed use, um, approved mixed use um, businesses and, um, and bed and breakfasts and they're very tiny two square foot signs right on the wall so they're more like plaques to blend into the residential character. Um, I will say we do also <laughs> allow ground signs for residential development so if you see us that's where you see the subdivision signs that say welcome to whatever it is the Ridge or Emerson Way or what have you. Um, if you, you remember, just I'm going to go quickly, um, there was a report done by American Association of um, Safety, Highway Safety Transportation Officials um, on LED signs specifically because that, and that was back in 2009. So a lot of the information about aesthetics and safety concerns um, you all discussed in drafting this, this ordinance. Um, so they looked at stationary signs as well as mobile signs like on, on um, vehicles and um, what the effects of those displays do to the driver for distraction and all of that. So that's fed into this draft ordinance that's in, that's in front of us now. Um, and through that report, I'm not gonna go through the details of the report, but um, 
there were lots of recommendations about how communities can address those safety and aesthetic um, concerns. And um, it's, communities address this differently across the country, um, and particularly they recommended putting um, um, a time, uh, minimum time, transition time for signs, and then at the transition point that it's instantly transitioned so you don't have a scrolling or sequencing um, sign that is very distracting as shown <coughs> through research to be, um, can cause serious accidents on the road network. Uh, also, they recommended um, curfews for sign lights to be turned off, and that's for impact, um, more of an aesthetic impact and also, um, you know, environmental impact. Um, there was also a recommendation coming out of their report about ways to minimize the impacts of LED signs by limiting the amount of space of the, on the overall sign that is um, allocated to that LED panel. Uh, and that is also reflected in this ordinance. So the recommendation that came from you all that went to council um, was um, there are a couple of components. This is a, there's a, some cleanup of the sign um, language um, throughout the, the package. There's some, there's some sections of the ordinances that have been interpreted in a certain way, but they're not written with that interpretation, so there's cleanup of that text. And actually, since this was introduced, there are two other items that um, have come to light, or actually one of them we'd been talking about for a long time that um, was not introduced in this. So if you um, are in favor of recommending those changes, you would officially need to recommend the package go forward with these two new items, and I'll go through those details. Um, so the goal of this ordinance is to address safety and create standards for LED lights, create parameters for the illumination levels and the time of um, illumination, and also create distinctions between residential and commercial districts, which we currently don't have in terms of sign lighting. Um, so um, I'll go through, um, I actually have the, um, I can put, we can go through the draft language. I can put that up on the screen if you think that would be helpful um, to go through the specific changes. So let me just um, get out of this for a second. Um, so the first section is, um, so 7.2 is the section that deals with sign lighting. Uh, let me see if I can um, increase the uh, text on that so people can read it. Um, so the first section to be amended is to change the um, jurisdiction. Um, and to define that um, we have internally illuminated signs, which also includes a dynamic display board, um, and and that it's not that the standards need to comply with dynamic display specificity, and no longer the chief of police. So that's section two B um, that's proposed to be changed. Um, the second, um, the next section within 7.2 
is um, this is the one that's been added since it was introduced and this is just really reorganizing the um, we allow ground signs to be um, directional signs so they're not they're primarily for directing the public to a certain property and half of the sign can also contain the business name mm -hmm. but it's really intended to be primarily the function of getting people to a certain location and this is um, simply clarifying the interpretation that's been on the that's been um, implemented for probably 20 25 years just we didn't we came to a zoning board hearing a couple of weeks ago and the um, zoning board members were really combing through the text and realized that's not really what it says so mm -hmm. this is really just to um, be more clear about the way it's been interpreted um, so then section 72e is also an added item since it was introduced uh, and this this is by the way the one that i sent you last week includes that i think you have a red line version of this mm -hmm. Um, so there's also there's always been a provision in the um, sign section that if you don't meet the by right standards for the size or the location the type of signs you can always petition for a special permit from the zoning board of appeals to get a bigger sign and this mostly is applicable in the commercial district so we allow a hundred square feet of sign for example and one sign in the commercial district um, but places like stop and shop and walmart and all the grocery stores want to have multiple signs across the face so they've all come in to the zoning board to request five signs instead of one 100 square foot sign so that's always been a provision um, there's also been a um, there's also an allowance to come forward for um, a special permit to extend the height um, or to go taller than the by right standard and the highest sign height that we allow right now is 15 feet in the commercial district and um, as you know we've done gateway planning for most of those commercial corridors and there's a plan and a vision for creating a more accessible um, multimodal um, corridor and so um, over time all the signs the maximum height as those businesses have turned over the ground sign heights have all come down they, you know they range from 30 feet 25 feet and so forth and they've all been brought down to the current maximum or less 15 feet 10 to 15 feet tall so we felt like this allowing a special permit to go taller than that is contrary to the plan for the city to create these um, um, cleaner gateways um, into the city. Just a quick question, going back to the size of the signs, yep. um, what are the parameters that are used to, you know, um, change what's here in writing and allow a bigger sign, just a, a bigger property? <coughs> you know what I'm saying, well, the, the um, applicant has to show that there's something unique about the property, that the way that the parcel is oriented, this mostly for wall signs, or that the nature of the use warrants um, a bigger sign. So it's not the a variance, big, right? No, it's a special permit. Yeah. So you have to show that the parcel is unique for a special permit. Um, yes, that it's different. That it's uniquely situated. Yes, it's not the same language as in the variance, but it's a special permit. That language is in the special permit provision of the ordinance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so for instance when you have a huge shopping plaza and you're set way back you might argue that the sign needs to be larger because you're trying to attract people from King Street or what have you so your sign needs to be bigger in order for it to be visible <clears throat> um, and the same for ground signs larger and in this case um, we're proposing that that the ground signs could be still be bigger than the 100 square feet but just not tall more than 15 feet above grade because that's quite a tall sign um, particularly right at the street okay so the next section defines 72u as would be a new section 72t sorry defining what a dynamic display board is so that it sort of covers everything that's electronic and then we don't have to go back in and if the technology changes to some other um, thing after we get through the LED craze. Can I ask about that, or should we wait until? Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Um, 
I don't understand what a video signal is. Does everyone else? Um, well, it's sort of, it, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not gonna tell you the engineering definition of that, but the point of adding a video sing, signal is just to um, include all the possible scenarios of how someone might put um, some kind of electronic display on a signboard. And so there might be video um, that's um, included on the screen, or it might just be text. Except the central part of the definition is capable of displaying a video signal, and then it goes on and saying include, including but not limited to other things. But I would, I mean, capable of displaying a video signal is the definition. Uh, Hopefully somebody understands what that means. Yeah, I mean, I actually, this definition, this proposed, this definition came from um, recommendations from AASHTO about how to address this and how to define it. And there are codes around the country that we've taken from that sort of the broader the definition, the better. And so we can certainly, um, if it's not clear to you that it includes all of that, you know, we could definitely wordsmith it. I mean, it's certainly not clear. It says including but not limited to, and it gives, what, three or four, or three, I guess, uh -huh. specific can, can kinds of project? displays. But those are just <laughs> examples of the broader category that's capable of displaying a video signal. Maybe they understand that in, in um, Silicon Valley. But so the video signal would be moving frames. So it's talking about how you get things that appear to be moving because you're doing frame by frame by frame as opposed to a static frame. And then okay, so what they're saying is that te different technologies can get you a moving frame. It could be through cathode ray tubes or light LEDs. So the, it's saying what we're getting is a moving image. So it is by definition a moving, I mean, I guess that's what I, sort of understood by the word video. So the, the, the sign in front of the high school is not a dynamic display sign. It would, uh, um, yes, it would be a dynamic display because it's, it's moving, it's changing. It's, it's changing. And it includes things like light emitting diode displays. Think of it as a very slow screen change. So that, it, so it isn't capable of displaying a video signal would include non I mean, non-moving but changing displays. You could have static. Right. So it's right. not a video in the sense of watching. Right, right. A, a but moving. It changes every 30 minutes, so. But it could be that. It, I mean, it, there's a whole range of those um, capabilities within this technology. So it could be that you <clears> just have one static frame. It could be that you have multiple frames that create um, the perception of a, a constant video. I'm not sure my so explanation helped as much as it might have clouded it because I meant video. So I was thinking it was not addressing the high school up for, up for all day until we reprogram it to be something else. Um, I think that the, the way I understand it and you know, this is not my, <laughs> this is not my specialty, um, is that you, this, this sign technology has the ability to display video signals and that include, encompass all those other things and that they could be, I mean, you can have video that's static, you can have video that's, so I would say that that falls, the high school definitely falls under this definition. Um, I mean, I assumed it included the high school because it's the difference between analog and digital. I mean, it's, it's not painted on something. It's, right. you know, it's, it's an electronically created video signal. You know, it's, it's, it's electronic, and so it's, you know. It's electronic. I mean, yeah, as I say, I don't understand the word, no. what the word video means. Uh, it's not. <coughs> Well, we can change video change to electronic, electronic if that, that if that right. helps. That might help. Okay. Uh, that's that, I think. 
I think the reason they use video is, I mean, I interpret it to be a, sort of a companion to audio, that it's not, it's not displaying an audio, it's something, hmm. you know, it's video because we're looking at it. Right. So. Mm. That's why, so electronic could, right. uh, electronic could also be audio, but right. video is, it's visual. Right. Okay, so if, if the word video is um, deleted for electronic, does that help? That is that good with everybody? It would be clearer to me, but I'm not sure I understand it anyway. I think video is a, yeah, I'd agree. confuses it rather than clarifies okay. it. Um, and so then there's a new section. We haven't really regulated um, licensed motor, registered motor vehicles as signs um, previously. So there's a new section about dynamic displays that are on part of a portable mobile vehicle parked in the, um, in view of the public way would be um, uh, restricted. And again, that speaks to the safety issue. If you're parked right on the street and you're sending all sorts of messaging out, but it's not really a ground sign because it's right. a registered vehicle, it still causes the same problem. So they wouldn't be regulated if it, if it were moving or um, just parked? Well, do we need the yeah. word primary purpose of advertising? What's that? Um, Can't we just end it? Sure. Yeah, I don't think that would, yeah. I think that would, yeah, probably eliminate some wiggle room. <laughs> yeah, to Tessa's point though, this, this references a car with a dynamic display that's parked. Right, because. A car that's in motion. So there's a whole other jurisdiction of moving vehicles <laughs> and zoning can't regulate those. <laughs> Maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so then we get to the residential district um, section and part of this is, is again sort of clarifying um, language that was has always been confusing to staff I think about how to interpret so it's an attempt to clean this section up about institutional other non-residential uses where ground signs are allowed but also at this um, incorporate new standards for these electronic signs or dynamic display signs so currently we do allow ground signs as I mentioned previously for um, membership clubs, funeral establishments, nursing care facilities, and, and the like. Um, and this would institute a, um, a curfew for any type of illumination for a sign for these types of uses um, to be in residence, so they're the ones in residential districts, um, to be turned off at 10 p.m. Uh, that was my one note I made to myself was, I know we talked about it and we came up with 10 o'clock, how, but I can't remember the discussion, you know, why 10 versus 9. And I was trying to think of a, a ground sign in a residential area yep. that would need to be on at 10 o'clock at night or 9, 9.45. You know, why, how, did, how did we end up with 10 o'clock? Um, and is there an example in town of a sign that we could justify being on at 9.30 versus well, I think the only answer, I don't know specifically, I can't remember specifically how we came up with 10, but I think if we take nursing care facility, for example, they might have their um, maybe a shift change um, around 9 or something like that, and not that employees are going to not know where they're going, but that at least it has gives a little bit of a window um, after that change potentially happens. Mm -hmm. The only reason I'm, I point that out is that during um, Zoning Board of Appeals uh, public hearing processes when an applicant comes and asks for a bigger sign, for instance, in a residential district, um, there's often discussion about turning that off and who, who are the people that would be coming um, that don't ordinarily know where, this, where such a facility might be. And um, so I think uh, that's the only... Um, you know, reason why I could see maybe after nine, but I mean, it's not, I don't know that there's necessarily a magic number. I think 
you know, in that well, somewhere in that time frame probably right. makes sense. If we're Nine thinking of it as a visual, you know, I don't want to use the word nuisance capital N, but sort of a visual little end nuisance, what time does the noise ordinance Well, I was just going to say 10 uh, That's p.m. 10. is so, so. And that would be consistent okay. with other annoying things that we can <coughs> That's do fine. something it's about. It's tied in <laughs> so, with, with something and there's a logic 10, to it, just, and that yeah. makes sense to me. Yeah. Versus I think you're right. 10, 10 yeah. o'clock is a feel-good <laughs> number. As you go out, 9 o'clock is, is a right. feel-good number. Right, so. right. But I think that... Um, so then we've broken that to sort of two different categories, churches, um, community facilities, and community centers can have slightly larger signs, and that's always been the case. We're not, um, um, this ordinance doesn't propose to change the size allowance for these two different types of uses. Um, and then the next part of this is to define um, illumination for those um, and to allow for dynamic display for these types of uses. Um, but restrict it to no more than half of the total sign area. Um, so the high school is a good example where there's the Northampton High School piece of it and then there's the LED display panel. So um, that's an example of um, a sign that doesn't have a complete LED panel. Is there a height restriction in this for these signs? Um, I thought there was, but uh, no, there, uh, oh, so I just four, checked. Uh, I don't think it's. Oh, it's just a square footage. It's 40 feet. Um, D has four feet from the ground. Mm -hmm. um, where, are you, where are you looking at? D2, 72D. Two. That is for that's for the that's for that's for the directional sign. So at a driveway, which is different from this section, I don't think there um, uh, is a height on this. But that's a good point. Um, but, so you have a ground sign that can't be more than ten square feet, which means you could have a ten foot tall. One foot wide. A sign, or so I think the 10 square feet, the fact that it's on the ground and 10 square feet limits you to an effective sign of being any size. But I mean, I guess. Well, it can be on a pole then, right now, right? This? Yeah. I suppose. Yeah, yeah, these are monument signs, or. Um, I mean, it seems to me it should be in there and be consistent with the other Yeah, if we limit that commercially for a ground sign at 15 feet. Right. And residential, we should. And and there are some commercial districts that aren't allowed to go above 10 feet. I'm just going to double check um, to see that we don't have that um, in another subsection of this, and it's just not highlighted in here. <coughs> um, uh, so I'll pull that up for doing this. So 10 feet um, it, are the smaller sign caps for. Um, like Central Business District and the um, Entrance Business District. So, I cer and 15 feet is in the highway business. So I, I wouldn't, I would, right. yeah, I wouldn't recommend <coughs> 15 feet. Um, but I'll um, look at this as we go through. Um, I feel like 10 feels big for residential. Yeah. As a height limit. Yeah, yeah I agree. And there are lots of examples of much smaller signs. So the bridge, road, nursing home is really yeah. sort of low profile to the ground. Um, a lot of the elementary school signs are much lower than that. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask, are you looking yeah. for No, go ahead. Uh, what's, what's the reason for the big difference in the minimum, let's see, minimum display time between <coughs> changes? 30 minutes in residential and one minute in commercial? Um, well, sort of the distinction between what kind of, what, what kind of messaging um, you're trying to get across in the commercial districts you might have. I think we talked about menu boards right. or, you know, whatever you, that might be for sale in a commercial district and the, the um, um, property owner or tenant may want to um, display multiple things or items that they might have on 
on site. Um, whereas in residential districts, they're typically to single use. It's institutional. There's not, I mean, the high school tends to display lots of different messages. <laughs> but, you know, if you think about a church or a nursing care facility, they're not really selling stuff. Right, it's um, informational. I mean, commercially, yeah, you're trying to attract customers. Residential, right. you're just putting out information. So why define it in the ordinance, though? Things you don't want the sign to be changing every minute in the residential area. Right. But right, it has a greater attention. By definition, though, you're saying it wouldn't be because of the nature of the uses. Well, it might be. Someone could still. Uh, right, unless we say it. it right. Could. I wouldn't want one across the street. Of right. If you lived across and every, you know, every 15 seconds it's, and it's a different color, blue, red, yellow, and you, in your window blinds, it's coming through and you and it's n between nine and 10 o'clock, you're trying to go to sleep, that would drive me nuts. And so this, so it's just informational, you know, re report cards do, hey parents, you know, report cards are coming out and 30 minutes later, go hamp versus Amherst or whatever it is, but it's not every 10 seconds. It's just mm -hmm. it's just informational. We talked about that okay. a little bit when right. we, last mm -hmm. time, and I and I and the argument made sense to me. Um. So and then we get to that piece about you know is thirty minutes too long of an interval before it changes? Um, so that may be something you want to come back to. Um, I mean that if you did twenty minutes, you could have three different. I wouldn't want to encourage, you know, different messaging every 10, 5, 10 minutes or whatever, right. but every 30 minutes that's two messages an hour and may, so that's maybe two messages a day that you're just rotating through during the course of the day or, you know, 20 minutes, it's three messages an hour. And it swaps within a second, so I don't know that, I don't, I don't know where that line is, but I, I don't have an issue with, you know, every 20 minutes. I wouldn't want to go past that. Mm -hmm. Right. So it would I'd be all right with 20 as well. But. Well, given what we just said, and that's in residential. What does it have to do it? At all. At all. Like right. once a day or something. Right, right. right. Yeah. yeah. That part, too, I mean, you can make the argument the other way. Right. I know we keep going back to the high school. That's kind of right. I mean, I don't want Kind of a different. It's like they, you know, be, because they have the capability to change the right. message, then they will change the message versus having something actually to say. Um, right. So. Well, and I want to make sure that we are accommodating a function that needs consideration. You know, right. I mean, that's what I'm worried about is that the idea that you can bombard messages because you have something you want to say doesn't mean that everybody that goes by wants to hear it. Right. And so I think there's, you know, I'm, I'm feeling reticent to make big changes. I'm, I, when we had this conversation last time, I was opposed to the one second change downtown. You know, that mm -hmm. just seems like we're encouraging that sort of uh, volume of messaging, really, because that's what you get is you get a lot of changeable messages. But I, I sense we have to have, we need an ordinance that does address right. the sign. So I think we're trying to be proactive and say we recognize that there is something needed to constrain the use of these signs in a way that is useful for the functions they're serving. And I can see where restaurants want to do something downtown and mm -hmm. businesses downtown. But I'm really, um, I'm really wanting to read it with a, a, a quiet reserve for yeah. residential. I mean, we're, we're talking about funeral homes or the high school or the Elks Club. Or the church. And do they do they really need to be rotating through a ton of information? But I guess like if we use the high school, I mean I could see, you know, you, people come and go twice a day when they're really busy. So you know, could they have one? You know, could they do it twice a day? Once in the morning, once in the afternoon. I mean, for a school, so you could catch parents, whatever kids, you yeah. know, when a lot of people are coming and going. But other than that, you know, no, they're not. Right. Yeah, they're not. So. And there is the danger of if you give the ability, then it, you know. They will. Yeah. Well, and I do think we're, you know, we are having a curfew on them. That's a good thing. Um, I think that is the let's all sleep at night sort of idea. There is sort of going back to the height in the allowance for um, monument signs for residential subdivisions or approved, um, you know, projects. There's a five foot height uh, maximum. So. It seems like it yeah. would make sense that that would be the same yep. for, so that could, should be included um, in this 
to um, subsection both of these, actually, <coughs> 73 C. Do we know how many LED ground signs in the residential area there are in Northampton other than the high school? I think that's the only one. All right. So then, but there are a lot of other signs that are have the internal, you know, fluorescent box right. that have the manual change. So, you know, it's probably inevitable that um, the request will, um, right. Yeah. Really yeah, right. Because you're cheaper for one thing. Limiting on the manual side, somebody running out every 30 minutes and changing the sign in the room. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess to to Devin's point, it. it you know, I, well, I don't really have an issue with every, you know, three signs an hour, you know, every 20 minutes. At the same time, for the areas that we're talking about, I really don't see the need, and maybe we should take baby steps, yeah. and maybe every 30 minutes, the way it's written, we should just let that stand. I don't really see a lot of pushback from funeral homes or the Elks Club saying, hey, we, we've got information we need to get out, so. And we, we don't, n n none of them are coming to us now saying, I need two, two signs every hour, you know, so this is, we're just trying to define it before it, before it happens. Okay, so the next section is, um, uh, so there's been, the addresses the bed and breakfast establishments, um, but, um, no allowance for the, the wall signs being um, LED. And then, um, again, the residential subdivision ground signs at curfew of 10 p.m. And then moving to the commercial district section of the sign ordinance, uh, the um, specifications would be minimum display time between changes would be a minute, and then that transition time is the same to the next display, one second, instant. Um, transition. Um, display boards shall not emit sound um, and be turned off at the close of business. And then the provision that um, photo cells, which is pretty standard technology now, that um, um, so well, that the I must let's go back to C for a minute. Display must be turned off at the close of business. What's the purpose of that? Um, it seems to me that if a business closes at 5 and it's dark out and they want to display their sign and they're in a commercial district, they should be able to do that. Well, part of it comes from the fact that many um, businesses that come in for larger signs or additional signs, when they come in for a special permit, at that time the zoning board is instituting um, a time limit on the number of signs, so it's sort of creating a uniform or more of a uniform standard that signs go off either a half hour or an hour after the close yeah, of business or at business or at the close of business. So um, that's really what it's meant to address. And LED signs, they're on, you know, they're on all day. So um, it's not as though even if the sun's out that they wouldn't <clears throat> be um, so they, sign well, like I mean, could they, uh, what happens if the dynamic display is left on but the message isn't changing anymore? I'm just getting light pollution in my mind. You, you're right. Well, I mean, I, I, no I disagree. I mean, you may say that, but there's people on King Street there. And, I, and I know they want free advertising there's at main night. Street. I mean, that's, but, I don't could, see what's wrong with we, advertising at night in a business district. I mean, we've, we've oftentimes we've had in commercial, when, you, when the business closed, if you have, if the parking lot's lit or if you have exterior, like wall packs on the, the lights on the exterior of the building, they have to be turned off an hour after closing. So couldn't you tie something like this into, into that so it's somewhat consistent? Um, Those things serve a different purpose. <coughs> um, lighting for a parking lot on a business that's closed is, doesn't serve a useful purpose, but Or the building, we, we have buildings that have accent lighting on the building itself, and before they've been allowed to just run through the night. So you, the building's illuminated, it looks great, but it's, it serves no function. <coughs> and so now with the new proposals that have come in f for us in the last few years, we've said when the, when the building's closed, you've got an hour to turn off the lights and then you're good. And so you could, you could argue this would be the same thing versus saying right when you, when at five o'clock when it works out, the lights are out. It's a commercial. Yeah, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering 
what the purpose is of that is because we feel that you know it's a waste of light or because it's a um, a distraction or um, I think it's more of a waste of light in the sustainable plan, isn't it, tied And that, that was what the genesis was, was right. the su sustainable Northampton that we're going to make every effort to. Yeah, but LED lights. Yeah, but these are LED lights is right. I mean, that's, that's why we're going LED lights, too. Well, I think of the purpose of them as being drawing people in while you're open for business. And so if you're closed. You're not trying to draw people. Maybe not at that time. But yeah, but you'll be open the next day. Right. No, I would, I would, I would rather not have an abundance of light. I, well, I would think of that in the category of night sky. I mean, just mm -hmm. we have right. we, we have shielded lights all over. You know, that's what we're going to now for all of our buildings and the parking lots. And so I put that in that category. It's a light that doesn't need to be on to to serve the business. The business is closed. I get the advertising piece of yeah. it, but the counter to that is, you know, the birds at Arcadia and all of all of the other sort of ancillary functions that are affected by light pollution. And I just think that it's a great place to draw the line for it, the business isn't open, so it doesn't need it at that time. I, I hear you from the advertising point of view of well, when you want me tomorrow, you'll know where I was because you remember where you saw me last night. But at some point, even the traffic of people around, and I think you'll get businesses that think, it's an LED light, I'll leave it on all night, I don't care. I, don't, I won't have to remember to turn it on again. And so at a time when traffic really isn't being communicated with, it's still on. So we're saying that these dynamic display LED lights have to be turned off. Right. But, but we're not saying all the other signs need to be turned off. Is that what we're saying? That's okay. what the, sec so that's the light box thing. signs. What about right. that? Well, this is just under the dynamic display. Right. I'm sorry, does, does this apply to the inside the store window display? Um, not, no. Uh, it, so the way that we, um, the current code doesn't regulate or allows a certain amount of glass area within a storefront to have a sign that doesn't count towards your overall wall sign. Mm -hmm. So not, it's not, wouldn't fall under any sign ordinance? Um, no, except for the, the flashing nature of it, you'd still have to comply with um, probably the transition. To, I mean, it would still be an LED sign, I guess, but we don't, we don't, maybe I should backtrack and say this, the size, you're allowed a window sign and it doesn't count against your <coughs> overall sign that you're allowed on the exterior of the building. Um, I think that um, it would still qualify as a dynamic display. Uh -huh. So it would still. And I guess the other piece, you know, it's one thing in the middle of summer where it gets dark at nine o'clock and winter on the other hand, it gets dark at 4.30 and that's, those are pretty limited hours. So, you know, perhaps you could look at, you know, when the business closes or not past eight o'clock or something like that would be another well I, mean, I think it's, it sounds like it's a good um, topic for discussion maybe you can get some public comment on mm -hmm. that too um, the the nature of LED signs are though that they're on all day long it's not like um, you know a box lit sign where it only turns on when it gets dark so that's the other um, thing. There's an energy drain all day long when these lights are on. It's not, so you're sort of transitioning for your, it's a greater, you know, better and more energy efficient system, but it's also on longer, more continuously. Okay, so, um, um, <clears throat> So then business signs, this, the next section is about the ground signs and specifying the um, um, same standards for ground signs. And that is, um, that's, the ex those are the, that's the extent of the changes. Okay, so I was remiss for not opening public hearing before your presentation, but it would be a good time to do that now. I think it was, you yeah. opened yeah. it. You did open yeah. it, but. Um, okay. Um, Can I, a quick yes. question. So the two <clears throat> areas that were added, uh, Carolyn, one was 7.2.T. <clears throat> so the amendments 
the D, D and E. D and E and M. And then the restriction to five feet will be a third. Okay. Right. And then there was another one that you recommended to um, change, modify video to electronic. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we still need to talk about when to turn off on the commercial end. Right. Okay. Anyone here want to speak about signs? Yes, welcome. State your name and we'll get you on the record. Sure. Sue Timberlake, Spring Grove Avenue here in Northampton. I wouldn't have spoken to this, but I'm here for a different issue. Um, I'm very pro-business. I worry a lot about turning people's signs off. And it just strikes me that, um, that if it's in a business district, it would be nice if it was till 10. And if you're gonna have people turn off their LED signs, think about this. I think we should turn off the Christmas lights then at the close of day. I think there's a certain aura, and I know about light pollution, I agree with you, but LEDs have so little impact, and it just strikes me that we're really trying to regulate. I'm, I'm conservative Republican, so I just thought somebody needed to say this, that I, I think the businesses should really be given, you know, sort of standard rules and have them be the same. So if you have a really pr pretty front window with, you know, blue lights in it and it can be on all night or on till 11 or on till 10, just be really consistent so that the LED signs are regulated the same way the neon signs are regulated. <coughs> Closed is in the window all night now. Um, but try and be really consistent for the business community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, sir. <clears throat> um, Andrew Crystal, president of the Academy of Music Board, and we have an LED sign. And going through your proposed changes, I was thinking about if we had not put it up yet, how would this affect us? And it, it would affect us in a number of ways. Um, and just a couple of thoughts to share as you continue your discussion. Um, zoning's addressed flashing lights for a long time, but those were flashing lights that flashed on and off. An LED, an LED sign has the capability to flash, but doesn't. The, the Academy is a good example. We post a message. When the sign went up, we worked out with the um, building inspector the timing. And initially, we had the message change more frequently. Uh, Louis asked that it be no more than every 10 seconds. I think what's being proposed is um, the sign has to stay for a minimum of a minute. For what we're doing, that wouldn't be effective at all. I mean, we've got a time so when you stop at a traffic light and you turn over and look at the theater, you'll see five or six messages over the course of while you're stopped there at the traffic light. If, we, if the sign could only change every minute, we would get one message. Um, and just as an aside, that sign has been the most effective advertising the Academy's ever had. We don't advertise in the newspaper anymore. Um, when that went up, the marquee and the sign, um, in a community that pretty much everybody has an opinion and is not afraid to share it. <clears throat> we only got one negative comment about the sign. It came from Bill Attender who lived across the street and had no shades in his windows. So I think that's a testament that that, that sign has been accepted. Uh, I think the idea of having it less than a second to change a message makes sense so that you're not getting a display that's distracting. Um, there were a couple of other things in the zone and I thought that I, I would like you to give some thought would, to. Would, would the, the language on C here force the academy to have their sign shut off? It would. No, because no. they're pre-existing non-conforming. Yeah, if they were if new. If we were coming in right. now. It would have to be shut off all if they were. Right, and, and so that's, Bill, that was the point I was trying to make is there are days go by when we're not open. That would mean technically per your, unless you had some uh, allowance within the permitting process to address specific situations, but if we could only have the sign on while we were open, it wouldn't be effective at all for us. Um, because, as I said, many days go by when we're not open. Um, I'm not sure that the purpose of land use control is to address property owners' energy usage. I don't think that's an appropriate um, rationale for regulating signs, I think. Aesthetic and light pollutions are reasonable. Um, the fact that a business may pay for the sign beyond during the day and choose to pay to have it on till nine or 10 at night doesn't seem to me like the purview of land use controls. So uh, 
I would just encourage you all to think about the academy. I think it's an effective sign. <clears throat> it hasn't proven to be a safety hazard in any manner that we've heard from the city or the police department. Um, and I think it's a good example as you think about real life, how does this regulation affect other businesses um, and how would this affect the academy if we hadn't already gotten a sign up? Thanks. Thank you. If in residential areas we're proposing to have signs turn off at 10 o'clock, then it would seem contradictory if you're in a commercial area and you close your business at 5, that your sign's got to go off too, five hours before a sign in a residential area. So what if you, we said 10 o'clock or one hour after closing the business? Well, what about Andy's um, point about them being closed half the week? Well, so it's still it then 10 o'clock. Well, 10 o'clock, not whether regardless you're open or not. Of whether you're open or not. Right. right. Those are two very different proposals. Right. Yeah, I think that. Like, it doesn't say at the for the high school sign, the high school's got to be open. It says it can between be more, 7 a.m. So that's the exception. So that you can stay, your sign can stay on until 10 o'clock or an hour after you close if whichever one is, is right. earlier. So you, you know, if you're closed. Why earlier? Why not later? I'm sorry, I meant later. Right. Um, that it could, so, but I think what Mark's getting at, it, it's not that if you're not open at six o'clock at night, then your sign isn't on, but that if you are open till after 10, you can have your light on right. until an hour after you right. close. So it's the provision for those businesses that are uh, operating later than 10. But that then I would feel like... Then why would they need an extra hour? I mean, if they're already open later than 10, then why not just 10 or whenever your business closes yeah. after 10? Right, that's what I would say. I think that what I like right. about it, it's getting simpler the more we talk about it. Right. I mean, I, I agree with the consistency yep. argument. And having residential being able to be open longer than in a commercial, that's not I still don't happen. even really know why we have to regulate turning off the sign, but that just sounds heavy-handed. Uh, in a commercial district, anyways, I, I just don't. I mean, it's a bright-lighted area downtown and King Street and Pleasant Street, and, you know, those lights bring a certain character to the city, and um, when you drive through it, you want to see kind of a thriving city that's... Um, full of business and not, you know, dark buildings as you go through. Um, and right. I, I, I don't think find the energy. sustainable plan, it was meant if you drive through the city at 2.30 in the morning, then Main Street shouldn't be lit up if not one of those businesses is open. I think it was an attempt to, it wasn't. Right. And I think most businesses do shut it down. And right. I mean, you I know. Agree, but was that the point? I don't know. <clears throat> well, that's where this was born out of was a sustainable Plan, yeah, isn't it? that we, you know, excess energy um, can, you know, right. consumption. Is I mean, if we're talking about energy use, it's a minuscule amount. Right. So we shouldn't but it's confuse the issue by talking inaccurately. Well, I, I don't know that you could make that statement that it's a minuscule amount. I mean, you know, how many signs? What What is the display? I mean, we I have mean, ordinances or, about people turning the heat down at a certain time. I mean, that, or, I mean, it just seems well. But very this, I mean, just going back to the sustainable Northampton. I mean, you know, it is a goal of of city officials to try to limit energy use. I think that's a really uh, responsible stance. There's all. I mean, there also is the issue of the light pollution. And granted, these signs are not like uplit signs, but they're the whole idea. You're creating a um, a glow effect 24-7. There's been a lot of conversation about that and the impacts of that. So, and it's not that, um, it, you know, this is um, a piece of the whole um, sustainable puzzle. It's not trying to use a land use regulation to get at energy consumption. The idea is uh, um, both aesthetic <coughs> and uh, um, environmental quality um, and energy. And I'm not saying that 24-7 is the right solution, but, you know, people are out and about till 10 or 11 o'clock at night, typically, and that doesn't seem on... Would you make a case that downtown in the business district it needs to be later than it does in the residential? Oh, yeah. And so then what, then what would you... We're again, so now we're a different zoning area. We're defining a different rule, so we're not keeping it as consistent as it was if we just said 10 o'clock. Yeah, but consistency isn't always... 
So that's why I'm exploring it. Right, right. Who would make zones. the case for another time, and what would that time be? For <clears throat> which district? Business. I would say 10 or 11 seems perfectly reasonable, if not later. Probably not 24 just, hours a day. Right now, it doesn't seem reasonable if, if you close at 5, but residential can stay to 10. That doesn't seem reasonable. No. So if, at the very least, it should be 10 and 10. If not, you could say, that's us thinking plus an hour yeah, or 11 o'clock or whatever. It should be at, at least as long as a, in a residential area. Yeah, I, I don't, the residential area is, um, I, why, what's the point of having that be till 10? That's when the noise pollution ordinance starts. So, and this so is visual. Kind of together, this is right, like visual right. pollution. Well, and let me give you one more that might. It's what I was thinking about the commercial <clears throat> time. We have, for many businesses, given them the hour past the, the business closing for their uh, perimeter lighting. So, what if we use that extra hour on top of the 10 o'clock and said 11 o'clock is a is a good time? So that that is recognizing another hour. So you could say 11 o'clock or until business closing. So if you're a bar that's open till one, right. yeah. whichever is later, right? Right. Whichever is later. Right. Push back. I didn't quite understand that. I was, so, just, I was just suggesting 11 o'clock for commercial areas. Or a close of business, whichever is right. Close of business, whichever and That sounds good. The other issue that Andy raised, I think it's also a good point. I, many times I've stood at that, uh, I mean not stood, been in my car, <laughs> sitting, uh, reading the sign on the Academy of Music and um, have to wait to only be able to see it every 30 seconds would yeah, the only, I, I agree, but I, I also have something to be said for the Academy of Music and the purpose it serves versus um, Joe's Bar and Grill flashing something at you. You know, I mean, I don't know. There's, I don't know how we ever we draw that line. I don't, I don't think we should make stage, decisions based on people being in their cars. I mean, I think the Academy is downtown. There's a lot of people who live and walk downtown. I just don't think well, that people sitting in a car at a red light should be the, the standard by which we make Except remember, this it, it is the commercial district we're talking about. Yeah, I know, but right. I live in a commercial. Well, there's a lot of people who are not by. in a vehicle, but, you know, so we're not sure. going to time it yep. for how long I feel like standing there in front of the Academy. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, it's right. just but a the, different But the concern to, was, instead of if you're at a, at a red light and right. you have the time to turn and watch a display, is right. if, you, if you're actually in motion, and you pass by a restaurant that has a scrolling, hey, special tonight, scrod, bakes, and you're trying to drive and read the menu at the same time because it's animated, then accidents happen. I so thought, that, I thought Andrew was making the opposite argument, that it's not, that the opportunity is not, wouldn't allow him to change it enough. They want to change it more when right. someone is sitting there. Right, and we're saying the way it's now, their sign wouldn't be as right. effective. Right, be as effective, but, we're, but that was a goal by ours to, to limit because Yeah, yeah, of, exactly. Because of, right. No, I agree completely. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm just saying that I don't think that the length of the traffic light shouldn't be the determinant of, yeah, we shouldn't fit in as many messages as fit in the traffic light. I think that's a terrible idea. I mean, one of the things that you could do to address that would be you could write in, um, you know, planning board approval if someone wants more than every minute and per provide parameters, or if the academy is unique enough of a situation and there may not be another one, then maybe it doesn't need to be addressed at this time. Right. So you could go, you know, I think either path. I guess I, guess I, I almost see it like the earlier with, you know, where the police chief is involved, you know, you don't want a distraction in traffic, whether you're at a stop at a light or, you know, I mean, you know, that's a very busy intersection you know do you do you want to create or allow a distraction and I guess that would be my um, you know just like you wouldn't want I guess the police chief determines if the flashing you know the where they have that you know almost case-by-case -case discretion but you know I mean that's a pretty dangerous <laughs> intersection to be right. with. Yeah. I mean if you're so walking down the street, street, yeah. street yeah. you're on the sidewalk looking at an animated menu Right. Fine. I mean, right. But if you're in your car and you're trying to read that animated right. menu, then that's it means you're looking at that instead of looking at right. the traffic light, right. and, you know, and things like that. So, so if 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 I own a restaurant on Main Street and I want to I want to message every 10 seconds and the ordinance doesn't allow, 
What's what's where do I go? Well, it says every you know every right now the way it's right. drafted. And I want it every ten seconds. Is there any opportunity for me? Not the way this is written. Right. So what could we could be given out and say unless special permit or unless or is it? Well, sure. You could write in a provision that the planning board has to you know evaluate the request based on the you know the unique circumstances. But then you sort of have to, then you want to think a little bit in more detail about what would those things be. Are menu signs for restaurants right. appropriate? Um, yeah. You know, and then how many restaurants do you so have? You're saying something's happen? allowable. So, you know, what would that be? Um, and so that's why I suggested that maybe, you know, the academy, because of, um, you know, the fact that they have different shows um, at different times and they're not open all the time. Maybe that's a unique circumstance. Um, so, like what did the Calvin come before you and and have a sign? Then that would flash every ten seconds. Well, it would be a minute according to this, but that right. Would be reasonable mm -hmm. to me. Right. Or what about thorns? We hit you know yoga class schedule. It's rotating and they've got and all of a sudden. I think I think a lot of this is being written. We're trying to be proactive for signs that haven't that aren't there yet. They may not ever come. Um, yeah, they want to be proactive, but not anti-business. Right. Uh, is that I, balance? I agree. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's sort of a transition between signs that are there to say, "Here's our business, and here are the kinds of things we do," and then outright advertising. That's you know. A newspaper spread of what you're selling that week, right. which is what electronic messaging allows you to do. So it's sort of a transition. Are we moving from signs to, you know, advertising content? Um, and is that is that, you know, how the idea is aesthetically? Is that um, what's the interest of the community to create these, you know, advertising boards, or is it really just or is this, um, you know, a small sign that can go up to advert, you know, to show what the business is and what kind of things they? And I'm sorry, did I see in there a, a foot candle um, maximum? Yes, yep. um, it's based on background ambient uh, point three. You think the academy? What is the academy like? Twenty? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, yeah. What if we changed it from one minute to 30 seconds? Yeah, I was just thinking that, actually, in the business district. Because that's 30 seconds is still, it's not like right. every five seconds. One minute know. came from the police chief? Is that, no. No. It came no. From, it's just from conversation, yeah. other what other communities have done. Okay. Um, you know, it's sort of, there's not a, set, there's not a standard. Well, I think there, one minute is too restrictive. Yeah. You, you really, I mean... In the standard for signs, but I've, the driver reaction time standard is 1.5 seconds. So that's what we use for perception to reaction time. So I mean, I think just to kind of give you a context for what the, the, the safety issue might be underlying it, that, that's what, I've got a problem, I need to hit my brakes and my brakes are going to react. It's a minute, it's a second and a half in the literature. So just to put that in context. Um, Do you get your foot candle answered? Yeah. Comments? Uh, you had one first and we'll get to you. Yes? Um, yeah, if I could. I think this is a really interesting discussion and I think it's great that you're being proactive and I think it will not be long before the time comes that it's more cost effective for people to put LED signs than backlit fluorescent signs. Yeah. They may just be static. So you may want to be thoughtful in the wording a, a store may put a sign up that could be LED, so fall under your regulation, and never change the message. That's a whole different technology. And the other thing I think it's helpful is the Academy is somewhat unique, but there are, there's a Calvin, there's other entertainment venues <coughs> that may have similar desires, uh, but then think about Walgreens on King Street. That's a, that's not a pedestrian street, it's people are in their cars, and if their message could only change every minute, it wouldn't be very effective for them. So I think somewhere in between, I think it's whether it's um, what, which business zone may require a little bit tweaking and timing 
um, as well as the type of business. And I think Carolyn's suggestion of providing uh, an avenue for the board to make a decision on a case-by-case -case situation is appropriate because the technology is changing so quickly. All right. Yes. Hi, Sue Timberlake again. I didn't mean to poke you guys with a stick earlier. Um, Spring Grove Avenue. Have you, does your um, um, piece of zoning uh, include the marquee sign where it actually moves constantly? So it's not static at all. So it disappears, just like, you know, the ticker tape. And does that, do you address it? And I just missed it, which is fine. No, I think it is a moving sign in our yeah. mind. It, it, do we agree? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, I was just sitting here and I was counting to 30 seconds after you mentioned that's a pretty long time. Mm. So I, I would consider changing that from one minute to 30 seconds if it was kind of just based on what um, other communities do or. I'm so old fashioned, I'm going to hold my nose no matter what the time is and probably vote for it because I just, I really, it's, I'd love to not have them, period, but then mm -hmm. I, I realize that that's not coming from a progressive business point of view. And it, it seems to me we've got, you know, they can come before us to stop and shop and the big guys and, and um, lobby for a bigger sign if, and it doesn't seem to be some real solid parameters other than, I guess, a certain spe special situation that makes common sense, so you know potentially you know leaving the door open at least maybe for for some time as technology develops mm -hmm. seems to still be somewhat consistent with the policy we already have and, and so this, this is going to move forward too for a, another round of discussion so this isn't the end so well, it's going to city council i mean i guess i would probably recommend without some further sort of um thought put into what you would consider under um, planning board approval so what situation might be appropriate to have a faster you know you might go with the 30 seconds whoever offer that and just see how it goes That's for, I mean. right. yeah. this isn't you know. this isn't done tonight so right. and I'd we, be, yeah. we could also provide that the the um, the board for unique showing of unique circumstances could allow different parameters but we can't put that in the ordinance. I mean, we why can't. Not? Right. Because it's so vague. I mean, why would. Well, I mean, you know, at that point, you'd probably want to have it as a special permit because then you'd have the ability to say, no, this doesn't seem to right. fit with the right. character of, you know, the community or what have you. But, um, but that's what I'm suggesting is you might want to think about more detailed language and, and probably not necessarily on the fly. Right. So either have a blanket special permit or just go with the, the, um, smaller window 30 second window as opposed to a minute and then let the ordinance stand for a year or two and right. if there are mm -hmm. people who come in and feel like they need I think I think I'd I propose that 30 seconds and so let it move forward what if I just summarize our notes into mm -hmm. what would be the changes <clears throat> Are so we sure that we're done with public comment I want to see oh, if there's anybody else yes thank you uh, Carolyn any other public comment Thank you. We'll Move close. to close public comment. Second, Mark, and second him by Tess. Sorry, Doug. Uh, so, the packages we read it coming into the meeting would have the following changes. It would have uh, uh, for seven two D. There would be uh, clarifying the directional signs for seven two E. There's a change. So those were two new ones. Mm -hmm. Um, we would restrict residential to a five foot height. We would change video to electronic just so it was more clear what we were talking about. We would have the commercial message uh, minimum time change for message at 30 seconds. We would have the sign go off no later than 11 o'clock. Or close of business. Or close of business. Whichever is later. Right. Whichever is later. And we would have, uh, no, no, if they close earlier, then they, could, then they could leave it right. on, on to 11. 11. Right. 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 Um, and then we would add an allowance for special permit for, yeah. or I don't know. We need that's to. A, yeah, we mm -mm. need to. We wouldn't need to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By reducing the time from one minute to 30 seconds. So do I? We're ready. 
So we need I hear a recommendation. A motion. Right. Recommendation to City Council. So I move to recommend the zoning ordinance changes move to City Council as just described by Devin. Second. Second by Bill. All in favor? Opposed? Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda. Um, at 7.45, we were going to take up the Parts and Rec Department Office Modular, JFK. Uh, let's let the hall know we're ready. Just, I'm ready, or how you're ready. I think so. Yeah, I didn't bring them. Up. Kevin, make my usual spiel about perch design. Thank you. So we picked up the agenda item for the Parks and Rec Department modular building. Um, I'd open public hearing, um, and Mark has an announcement. Uh, just a point of reference, uh, the presenter I've done because of my uh, line of work, I do a lot of work with Berkshire Design. Uh, I don't think it prevents me from being impartial, but if anybody in the public feels differently, you can raise your hand and I can recuse myself. Okay. okay. So, I, I probably won't stick around for the bottoms row. Bottoms row. Okay. It's taking a little longer than I expected. 
It looks like it's finally coming up. Okay. Okay. Yay. Set. Hi. How are you? Good evening, everybody. I'm Dave Pomerantz, Director of Central Services. Um, here to talk with you this evening about the modular building project at JFK for the Parks and Recreation Department. Um, with me this evening is Rachel Loeffler from Berkshire Design. Berkshire Design is the engineering firm and LA firm on the project. And also with me this evening is Anne Marie Mogio, Director of Parks and Recreation Department. Um, if you get into questions this evening concerning rec department operations as they would exist at JFK, I want to defer to Anne Marie um, since that's her her bailiwick. Um, I'm sorry. So um, I'm going to ask Rachel to come up in a couple of minutes and sort of walk through some of the site-related issues concerning the project. I just want to give you a little bit of overview and background on this on this building project. Um, as I'm sure all of you know, the Parks and Rec Department has been a Smith Folk for many years um, and needs to vacate the, ironically, the modular building they've been occupying at Smith Folk for many years. Uh, we have a June 2016 deadline. Um, we looked at various other options. Everybody's familiar with the Fiker, non attack situation. Um, we ended up at, at JFK for a number of reasons. Uh, we did look at Arcanum Field, uh, building a building there. Uh, the main drawback to going to Arcanum, which would have been a great site because of the programs that Parks and Rec runs there, the fact that they have Safety Village, they store a lot of equipment there. The main drawback was that because of the way that park was developed, we would have had to go to the state legislature and get a two-thirds vote to put up a non-play field type building. Um, obviously, it wasn't going to happen. Um, we looked at um, other areas. There, I have no vacant land, I'm sorry, no vacant square footage in any of other city buildings that we could have relocated uh, parks and rec to. So we started looking at the schools. And because of the existing programs, primarily summer programs, the gymnasium, the tennis courts, the pool uh, that Parks and Rec already runs at JFK, and the proximity of them being at JFK in relation to both Arcanum Field and other programs they're running at Look Park, we focused on JFK as a spot to uh, construct and install a new modular, off a new modular office building for Parks and Rec. Um, we had several meetings with Leslie Wilson, the principal, and John Provost, the superintendent, looked at various locations at JFK. Um, there was a lot of discussion concerning integration of office functions outside people coming onto the campus, um, in relation to daily school activities, campus safety, and in the end, the location that we are going to be putting the building up in proved to be the, the best location at JFK and the location that both the, the superintendent, John Provost, and Leslie Wilson felt um, helped the campus as well as was the best location as far as safety was concerned. Um, we decided to go with a modular because of the quick turnaround time as opposed to doing something in you know, a block or stick built on site. Um, for, you, for you, that, uh, you that don't know about modulars, they're factory built, quick turnaround time, uh, all climate controlled building. 
while the building is being constructed at the factory and it gets inspected by Massachusetts state inspectors and signed off on as it does by the building commissioner here in Northampton. You're doing your site work, uh, you're putting your foundation in, and then the building is delivered. Uh, the size building we're talking about, 2,150 square feet, would be delivered in three 12 by 60 boxes that get are called married together and placed on the foundation. Um, there's a fair amount of site work. It's concentrated in the area on the northeast side of the school. Um, Rachel can talk more about some of the uh, drainage and infrastructure details in a minute. Uh, but the plan is uh, we are going to contract with Vanguard Modular. That's the uh, company they're located. They're a national company, but they're located in Danvers, Mass. Um, we would have engineering plans back from them in about three weeks, uh, start the site work and foundation work with this weather we've been having. I'm expecting that any frost and uh, drainage and drying out the site uh, is going to be much quicker than it was last winter. Uh, so we're looking at getting a fast start on this. And uh, again, uh, Parks and Rec needs to vacate their site uh, at Smith Volk uh, the first part of June. Um, questions so far uh, concerning either the building itself. I can talk more about the details of the building exterior, the interior, how it would be laid out, uh, materials, uh, or we can start to move into the actual site itself. Uh, I've been asked, and I'll just repeat this, that there is a distinct difference between modular and temporary, and I know that the building out at the jail has been in the news for not being a building that was easily upkept through its life. Right. Is this that same genre of building, or are we actually talking about a quality building that that doesn't have a temporary aspect to it? It's got a it's modular just by its construction method, but that it's it is never intended to be a temporary facility. Right. It's it's a modular building in terms of how the building code classifies it uh, under state rules and regulations as far as how it needs to be constructed and how it needs to be inspected. But unlike the building at the jail. Uh, this will be a new building. We're not leasing something. This is a new building designed specifically for Parks and Rec. Uh, and we're looking at at least a 20-year lifespan on the building before you're looking at maintenance uh, beyond just some touch-up paint here and there. So they do have, and as the technology and, and the industry has evolved over the years, you do have... Um, better components, better materials, uh, more stringent construction. It meets all the energy code provisions as they now exist in the state building code. So you're talking about a well-insulated, low-energy use building, uh, double-insulated low-E windows, uh, thermal-insulated doors. Uh, when most people think of a modular, they think of, you know, like you said, Deb, in the temporary, it's going to fall apart and it, it leaks and it, it, it's not energy efficient. This is a far cry from that. Any other questions? Okay. So, Rachel, can I have you come up and sort of do an overview on site issues? Sure. And I can jump in on utilities if you need. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, two two pieces of information to show, share with you. This is this is more of a um, just a general massing study of of the size of the building in relationship to the JFK school. Um, so, this is the JFK school. Uh, Bridge Road is along this axis. Spring Grove <coughs> Avenue is over oh, is over here. Uh, the The modular footprint is about this size in relationship to the school, uh, and it's separated from the housing the neighbors by the, by a screening fence. This is a view looking back at JFK from the sports fields, and you can see what that mass of the of the modular would look like. Um, this is a view from this corner of the parking lot looking back at the modular and how that fits within the context of the school and, and the neighbors and the houses. And this is a view from, from the one of the entrances on the school looking back at the modular. Sit back here. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so then.
another way of looking at the site from, from above. This is the JFK School, Bridge Road, Spring Grove, um, and the location of the footprint of the building in the corner of the lot. So zooming in a little bit more, Spring, this is the spur that connects to Spring Grove Road, JFK School, this, this part of the page. Um, and this is the area that we anticipate working in to put the building in. How close is the building to the property lines, the budding property lines? At the closest, we are 15 feet, which is the setback for this zone. 15. Mm -hmm. So the building does have some beneficial adjacencies for the use, shared use between the parking lot for the school and the building could share the same parking spaces by aligning it with the with the drive um, where we're not, you know, we're gonna share the parking spaces over here so we're not increasing a lot of impervious surface for the use of, of parking um, at the building. The, the, the ball fields are over here to the north, so in, this, in these plans, the north, north is to the left. Residences are off to the upper part of the page. Um, we are providing um, bicycle storage, three parking spaces for bikes, and an accessible walkway up to the entrance of the school, of the modular building. Um, we, we will have to remove some of the trees existing trees that are lie between between the uh, residences and the school but we plan to to replace those and plant those can you describe those a little bit more um the existing trees are pine and there are, there are nine these so from from here, these these trees will have to be removed. How tall are they? they're pretty tall they're like what did you say yeah. oh, you say and did you say they're going to be removed but then replaced? Yeah. So then, we, then we're we're planning on planting, um, we're planting replacement trees much more than. Um, we we had some concerns about. Making sure that the area between between the modular and and the fenced area did not become a a place for people to hang out. Um, so we we would be moving the existing chain link fence back a little bit and um, then gating off and fencing off the areas behind behind the modular. We have a second means of egress out this side of the building. In terms of utilities to help. Um, to help with cooling and then also to um, help with views from the neighbors, we would be placing the HVAC units on the side of the building on the north side where it's cooler um, and not on the top of the roof. We have some concerns about noise. Um, but no, I'm sorry, but back to the three replacement, those arborvitaes you're planning to put in, is that what the replacement trees are? Um, yeah. As utilities, um, there's another advantage about this location. Its proximity to all municipal services are very close, so it reduces costs to the project. For electric, we there are two two electric poles on Spring Road Spur. And we talked to the utility company, and we, we connect subgrade from this point into the building. As far as a sewer line, there's an existing sewer main that runs from the school in this direction. So we, we were we we're going to connect into that. Um, in the terms of heating, it's propane, right? Yes. So, yeah. We have a, a pad for a propane tank outside the building on this side. And then in terms of drainage, on site, the site is very level and very flat. There is a there's an existing curb between the parking area and this area. Um, so we're gonna sheet flow away um, 
from the edges of the building. And then the parking area, we're gonna be collecting into a catch basin um, that's eventually piped back to your, to your, your main line here. Um, we also, we had some discussion. Um, eventually. I'm sorry, did I hear you right? Sorry. Um, we are providing a catch basin. We're, repla we're replacing a catch basin and we're connecting it back to this drain structure here. Um, we received comments from the city of Northampton, DPW, and we responded to them. Is that something that you would want me to read through now? Or? Um, you don't need to read through the DPW comments. Um, there will be, I can generally go over them. There are a lot of utility connections and replacements, so I think you can generally cover those with a condition that um, requires them to meet the utility standards for the city. And we, we have responded those, to those comments and we've made changes to the plans and we have stamped and signed plans here today. Okay. Are you not calling? There's no calling? I'm sorry? Is there no calling system? Uh, the units that Rachel's talking about, they're a combination heating and cooling system. So they will be on the side of the building and then they'll be. Splits? I'm sorry? Are you doing mini splits? No. Uh, they're called BARD is the manufacturer. Uh, they're probably three foot by four foot uh, units. Uh, they're specifically manufactured for modular units. Um, high efficiency units, heating in the winter, cooling in the summer. So I'm sorry, where, where are they on the site? So if you're, they'll be on the north side of the building, so the side closest to the playing fields, mm -hmm. down low below the roof line. So that they're not exposed to the full sun. Um, and then the units will be piped into the modular and then dispersed above the ceiling with diffusers and returns. And the other thing I'll just note is that um, the propane tank, which shows on the south side of the building now next to that second means of egress, we're gonna move that over to the north side of the building. Uh, it's gonna, it's just a better fit. Are there so, any questions so far? Yeah, is this the end of the presentation? We'll get, we'll open it to public. Um, any questions from the board? Just, if you're gonna replace the trees, why are you taking the ones out to start with? Um, we need to, the root ball, if you look at, this is the footprint of the tree, okay? So that's the extent of it. And if we, you know, as we put in the drainage lines, as we start to excavate out for the foundations and the footings, we couldn't save, we couldn't save those trees. Uh, and you'll be following the tree ordinance and putting in the replacement trees that that calls for? Yes. Um, I've got a question about the sheet drainage to the back. Um, I have one set of plans that shows that the corner is 13.8 feet, and I've got another set of plans that show that it's 15. So how far is that corner from the back and what are you going to do to control the runoff if you put in sheet drainage back there? I'm going to get a plan so I can actually see it. Well, I, this has 13.8. Oh, yeah, but I, I, I did find on another one where it's 15, which is the setback, which made me feel better. Well, look, look, look. Be, be looking to set back to the fence that's the property line. That's how that's the property line. Yeah. But the fence is inside of the property line. Okay. But the fence is inside the... Yeah, I had just assumed the fence was on the property line, so thank you. Uh, and speak to drainage. Um, so if you look at sheet L102, it shows that
So we're we're 285.89 at the back of the building, um, and the existing grades along the back are retaining those. Um, so we're we're subtle, we're raising it up just a slightly, just a slight amount from the 285.34 that it is today. Okay, so you're within the same foot of elevation as what you've just told me. Right. Any other questions? Um, so that propane tank, so you're moving it to the north. Where, like, how will the, how will you get deliveries back there? It's not, it's not hardscaped. I'm just, I'm trying to picture that. You've got a chain link fence there with a man gate. I'm sorry, what, the question was how do you get what? Yeah, how do you, uh, when the truck comes to deliver your propane, how does it access? Well, the gate will be locked, mm -hmm. and they'll have access to it um, with a key. Otherwise, that gate stays locked. The pad is 5 feet by 12 feet inside the gate area. So it, there's really, there's no activity back there. That's why we're putting the gate up and relocating the fence. Okay. Is there any new uh, sight lighting going in? No. Um, all the existing lighting, there's pole lighting around that section in the driveway. The only new lighting, and we'll meet the dark sky ordinance with this, will be on the two egress doors to the building. Mm -hmm. There will be down lighting uh, with standard fixtures, on two fixtures, that's it. No wall packs, uh, no lighting around the back, no spotlights. Uh, we've got more than adequate lighting. Any other questions from the board? Just a little bit more, and I guess, you know, my concern is how close it is to the line. I realize it's within guidelines, but you're taking out some um, some pretty mature trees. Um, and it's hard for me to visualize or understand a tree barrier that you're going to be putting in and how long it'll take before the neighbors maybe I'm sure there's probably concerns about uh, this building in, in your backyard. Can you comment on, on I mean, is that just like a row of trees? Is it a little forest? Is it, I mean, what's the, the how's it going to look? There's no yeah, pictures of it. The eastern red cedar is a native tree to our region. It is a quick grower. Um, and we, we want to start with a t the tallest. So the, there's always a trade off in selecting trees and sizing trees about. Um, how well they're going to adapt to a situation. So if we went for a really large tree, like it's full size, um, it may not survive it, its transplanting. And so if you go with a smaller tree, it has a much a much higher chance of planting. And so the size, the eight foot high tree, was kind of right, right on that cusp, that ha happy cusp of being able to know that we could install something that will have height above head height um, and something that will grow fast and that will have a good chance of survival and continue to grow tall. So we've spaced them out um, nine feet on center. So it won't take long for them to screen in horizontally and then it's just over time they will continue to get, get bigger. The other thing I'll point out is that I'm sorry about the fence uh, along the stream back of the adjoining property owners. There is existing vegetation there, and there are some accessory structures, uh, some sheds and whatnot. So obviously, we're not touching any of those. So coupled with the, the trees that um, Rachel's talking about, with the existing vegetation, we feel we'll provide a good screen and, and with the quick growing, replace what we're going to take out for the foundation work. And we couldn't pull the building any further to the um, the west, because we're right at the edge of the driveway that goes around on the curve there. So we're getting into the parking lot issues at that point, mm -hmm. uh, along with the catch basin issue. If we went further to the north, we would start to impact the sports field of play and run out. Yeah, it's pretty tight. Is there any information on, any estimate on traffic, expected traffic? Um, no, but municipal use, um, 
does it require um, evaluation of, of that? So would we not consider it in, in right. our thing? We wouldn't consider traffic in our, okay. okay. Um, just going on the tree, it looks like I have a Google Earth image of the that area. There's some deciduous trees. Are those on the private property side, the taller deciduous trees? Yeah. Okay. Those look like they're pretty significant. Um, yeah. 30, 40 feet. Yes, but, I mean, trees planted nine feet apart that are only eight feet tall, it's going to take them a few years. I mean, they're, they're I mean, you know how that's going to feel. Mm -hmm. um, that's the spring grove side. So these, that row of trees is there. Are you satisfied that the water runoff is being handled correctly? Yes. Um, there, there's no other use. You know, you've got the outside handicap ramp. Uh, there's no other uses or activities going on around that building. Um, so basically the way it's designed for sheeting and collection into the catch basins, um, we feel it's the right way to do it. Well, since you've got a dig up and plant those trees anyway was there any conversation about a rain garden or some assurance that that water stays on site so what we're doing i did not mention um what we're doing if you could flip to the next page um, if you could look at sheet 102 yep. those are some of the comments that we got back to dpw is how can we infiltrate more water and keep it from leaving our site so the plans that we're submitting tonight show show a change to that and I've highlighted those in red. So we're gonna take all the roof water from the building and give it a chance to infiltrate. We'll, we'll be able to accommodate a two inch storm event. Um, so the roof, the roof lines coming from the north and the east of the building will go into a trench with three quarter inch stone. It's four feet deep, three feet wide, and that's sized to accommodate the two inch storm. Additionally, there's an existing leaching manhole to the south of the building that all of these pipes for the roof will eventually, not eventually, that will connect to. Um, if that, if there is a greater rain event above two inches, six inches, or God forbid, that then has a chance to connect to our municipal system. Um, so that's the roof water. And then also there's an existing rim to the north west of the building in in lawn area that we are we are going to intercept with our catch basin um, on this plan not on your plan and we're adding another leach basin there also so water coming from the field or in that area will have a chance to go to a lower elevation to leach into the ground also and the site has very sandy soils so we're confident that it will it will drain Okay. I like that. Thank you. One quick question. Um, how much, how large is the space you're vacating? Like how many square feet is the space that you have to vacate now? Uh, the space they're at now is approximately 1,900 square feet. Okay. So this is bigger than that. This is 200 square feet. For the same six people though, right? Yes. Or, okay. Yep. Is there a smaller, a smaller yeah. modular building? Modular boxes come in 12 foot widths by whatever lengths. Okay. So if we went up or above it, if we went to like 57 or 58, we're below the square footage. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, we're maximizing what they need, but we're minimizing oversizing okay. based on industry sizes for the boxes. So that 36, so those three buildings are sort of cut across horizontally, the three pieces that are yes. together? Yes. Yep. 60 feet runs north to south, 36 runs east-west. And they get married together, bolted together. Uh, the roofing gets finished, the walls get finished, yes. The flooring gets finished. So 24 by 60 wouldn't be large enough for the department? Correct. So I had exactly that same line of thought because I measure my office today and it is nothing like 15 by 15. And so I, 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 yeah, I went at it that way, but that's not really our purview. I mean, the city scaled its building, they're presenting it to us and we're looking at the runoff and the, and the, the neighborhood issues and the traffic, if it's appropriate in this case, I think we ought to talk about it, but I think it's, uh, it, it's covered under the city building issue.
Okay, I move we open it for public comment. Second. 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 Yes, sir. My name is Kevin McDonald. I reside at 220 Spring Grove Avenue. And um, we had a very good meeting back in December with the mayor and with uh, David. And there were some areas that I think we had reached some uh, hopeful consensus on. Uh, the lighting was addressed tonight, and I don't think there's been any variation from, from that. That's cons consistent with what we discussed that afternoon. Um, the heating and cooling system, I want to clarify, is the plan to put this outside the building, the HVAC units? On the side wall of the building. But outside? Yes. Okay, because so we have, I have an email right here from council person Alyssa Klein today, based on a conversation she had. Turn around. Made. Oh, yes. Excuse me. We assured her that yeah. this would be in a closet You'd inside the board. And, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the wording of the uh, email was that, uh, hi all, I spoke to the mayor about the HVAC question, and he assured me the plans they have accepted include the system in a closet inside the building. That doesn't sound to me with what we're hearing this evening, and I think our concern uh, on our meeting in December started with the idea that you know, not only was the height of the building of concern as to what it would do to enjoying our backyards and the existing view we have of, of not just the school, but Bear Hill in the background and so forth, but the apparent intrusion upon our enjoyment of our properties uh, in the backyards with the noise, especially in the warmer months, with units going on and off on a fairly regular basis. And it was strongly suggested by those of us in attendance uh, we encourage uh, the city to look into the possibility of incorporating the units in the interior of the building to minimize this noise. Now, I've, I've got an email here that states the mayor's commitment and assurance that this is going to be inside. That seems to be in conflict with what we're hearing here this evening. That is a great concern. Okay. Um, I really would ask you to be sp speaking to the board. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other concern... Uh, is going to be on the trees and how that issue is being addressed. Um, many of us that reside on that side of Spring Grove Avenue mm -hmm. are at or approaching retirement age. And I'm not sure we're all going to be here to enjoy the 5th, 10th, or 25th anniversary of those tree plantings. Uh, but we certainly enjoy the privacy and the uh, mitigating uh, properties that they afford uh, those neighbors now and trying to provide a buffer between the um, school property and, and the backyards. So uh, I would only hope that there's been a great deal of thought put into the amount of trees, the number of trees that have to be removed that are subject to damage <coughs> during the siting process. Because uh, obviously, as you just yourself stated, it's going to be some time between before they fill in. One of the main concerns we also had was uh, with regards to uh, parking, uh, traffic, increased traffic, and enforcing access, uh, entrance, and egress from Spring Grove Avenue onto the school property. And over the six years I've been in the neighborhood, uh, from parents who try to avoid going into the main entrance of the parking lot entrance off Bridge Road, when they're dropping their children off or picking them up. Some continue to choose to have the kids walk across the property out to Spring Grove Avenue and they park on the street waiting for them to uh, leave school or arrive in the morning. Uh, the barriers that have been up there uh, have not really been in place for the past few weeks. I don't know if they got damaged with uh, the one or two issues of snow removal we had. We've had a wonderful winter. It hasn't been as bad as last year, but Right now, on occasion, there are two plastic orange uh, pipes, if you will, that stand about three and a half, four feet high, but two of them doesn't provide a lot of security. And I've noticed in the past week or so, there's been nothing uh, to prevent anybody from entering or leaving that, that access road. Uh, the barriers are over on the curb. Uh, so with the addition of what we are told is only going to be five or six full-time employees, uh, that are going to be using the office space 
and that they're going to be swearing in Scouts Honor to only enter from Bridge Road, and if those occasional people, board members from athletic groups or whatever, may be coming for a meeting, we're going to have to hope that they also honor the entrance on Bridge Road and not try to use a shortcut through Spring Grove. This is an ongoing concern, uh, not only for the safety of our neighborhood, uh, people that are always out, a lot of people choose to walk on the side of Spring Grove when they're with their children on bicycles, uh, with strollers, or if they're out walking their pets because the age of the sidewalk on the opposite side of the street uh, is somewhat inconsistent. Okay, probably would take some money, which the city I'm sure has got earmarked for other priorities to update, widen, and make those sidewalks even. But the reality is people are using Spring Grove uh, and they do walk along the side of the road and you know traffic is obviously going to be a concern. So I wanted to express my concerns. The one thing that really has me concerned is seeing this information today that the mayor has said the HVAC units are going to be on the interior of the building. That's not what we're hearing this evening. And I do want to certainly add whatever import my remarks have to concerns about the buffer zone with the trees, how that's going to be most efficiently done to protect our property and keep us as close to where we are now. Uh, and also, we want to make sure that the uh, uh, the parking is enforced as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, excuse me, you said your address is what? 220 Spring Grove Avenue. My property is probably the one of the, if you come down from the uh, access driveway, I'm the third one down toward the cemetery. Uh, overall, I'm probably going to personally have the, the least impact to my property, but I certainly share the overall uh, adjustment that the whole neighborhood, especially our side of the street, has got to make uh, to the uh, addition of the structure. Um, it's certainly going to be in sight line to my left as I look out. And if the HVAC units are out on that side of the building, I've got to feel that I'm certainly going to be able to hear them. It, I, don't, I don't like to use air conditioning myself as much as possible or as, as necessary, but my windows are open in the summertime or anything. Those are, you know, I'm sure I'm going to hear those units going on if they're on that side of the property or the building. It, it, tell me if I'm wrong. It looks like your house is 250, 300 feet away from the northerly edge of the proposed building. And your point, sir? I'm just asking, is that I, I've never measured it. I, I couldn't confirm or uh, give you any insight into that. I do know it's a very quiet neighborhood. I think that's one of the reasons most of us chose to live there. We've got a dead end, and literally it went into the street with the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, what amounts to a, a very large series of cul-de-sacs, if you will, Hastings Heights, Leno Terrace, and Sterling. Everything kind of connects into each other. So you don't get a lot of traffic of people cutting through there. Uh, they either are coming home or they're coming to visit someone. There aren't too many people who drive in there by mistake. Uh, so, you know, it does have a certain charm to that neighborhood. It's a certain, uh, uh, it's kind of nice. Uh, it really uh, tends to keep things under control. As I say, at night, it's very quiet. So you're going to hear things, whether I'm 250 feet or whether I'm 50 feet, I'm, I can still hear things. I can hear kids playing on the basketball court behind the school. And there's been nights when they're supposed to be off at dark. And I've had to call the police department, and they've come up and shoot them away. Anything that happens on that back area, there's a, I have nothing besides a chain link fence in the back of my yard. So I hear anything that happens all the way across the tennis courts to the basketball courts. Uh, there, there's nothing to mitigate the sound. So uh, that's, what, that's what I base my, my thoughts on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another comment? <coughs> Thanks for waiting us out all this time. Thank you. Your name and Lauren address? Denver, and my address is 212 Spring Road. So I'm the one that the propane tanks and the uh, HVAC is going to be very close to my screened in porch and my hammock and where I play with my kids and my, my niece and nephew and all that. So, um, you know, this, the, when you live against the, a, a, a property like the school, you make adjustments as time goes on. We've lived there for 25 years. 
So when the um, addition came on, we that's when we sort of had to adjust our landscaping. And we've left this old maple tree that's really quite sick still grow there because it blocks the the it, quite extreme light that, that's over on that side and most of the sound, sounds are quite happy sounds and we feel like we've got a pretty good neighbor situation going on there but this is quite close if you if you go there you'll see it's a very small strip of land um, between um, so but the the adjustments the the trees that are coming down it's pretty sad they're huge um, seeing that they're going to be replaced by 10 others is a is a consolation for sure I don't know much about how things grow but I but I can it I I, I hope they can grow there because one on one side is going to be a building and on the other side is going to be a fence and I don't know you know how well they would survive hope hopefully they would um, and like Kevin is saying I think the main concern I have is I can't uh, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing you know the trucks coming and delivering the propane that that's probably not that frequent we could live with that but I am quite concerned about the the heating and cooling systems being right on the other side of my fence and through the from the conversations we had it is possible to put these things inside of these buildings um, the main concern is that it takes up space but I, you know where they're going from a bigger space to a I mean for, to, from one size space to a to a much bigger space anyway and it seems to me one one thing we talked about was moving it from the roof to outside of the building but we made clear that our preference was that it not be outside the building but inside the building to minimize sound um, so and then I think too I think that we it, it seems like the lighting is probably not going to be as much of an issue it would also be one that would be nice if, though if they if it could be turned off you know like you know if light the if those outdoor lights could be turned off at a certain hour in the in the night as well um, so I think that kind of speaks to it. So it's it's directly behind my house and it's directly behind Anne's house. You want to see anything? Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so Anne's is Anne's is the is the yard that the trees are coming down from. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And get your name and address. Yes, my name is Ann Wilson. And I'm uh, 204 Spring Grove Ave. And I'm right on the other side behind the building. Um, and I just want to echo what Kevin and Lori said as far as the heat unit, um, the noise of that. Um, I'm also very concerned about the, the, um, the access road. There's a sign that says unauthorized, no vehicles allowed, but there are an awful lot of vehicles that do go up and down. There. And I've had concern about that ever since I've moved in for the last 20 something years. And there's not a lot of it. There's nobody that's really enforcing that. And so I think it's important that we continue to put those barriers up because a lot of people do use it. And people come to the rec center all the time to sign up, I think, to, and whatever. And so if that's open, I think people are going to use it. And I just think it's very important that since this is going in and whatever, that we have safety in our neighborhood in that an unauthorized road is not used by vehicles going back and forth in some sense that somebody is going to enforce that and look at that and pay attention to that. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Other comment? We're just going down the street. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have seen those plans. I was trying to look at the other plans. Sue Timberlake, 190 Spring Grove Avenue. Um, First of all, it doesn't really affect me. I'm just a little further down from you guys. And I have beautiful pine trees that are probably the same <clears throat> vintage as yours. But they're on my property. And when you start to work around a tree, you guys probably know this, and one of my questions is, has the tree committee looked at this? When you start to work around a tree, the roots are the same size as the limbs. So you can look at a tree and see where you will do damage to the roots. So when they go 13 feet, 8 inches away from their property, I think they're going to damage their trees, not only the trees that were put in place from what I understand. I think the town spent, uh, was it $1,000 per tree when they built the school to, to give them a buffer? So we're going to take down these trees that cost $1,000 and have you know, 20, 30 years on them and put in these little bushes. And I just think that's really, talk about sustainable. I mean, that's crazy. So I'm sort of making sure that people support the idea that those are shade trees, that those should go through the regular process for trees. They're on the border of a public piece of property. And if the shade tree committee hasn't looked at it and signed off on it, I don't, I don't think it should go forward. 
The other thing I want to say is that just like um, they were talking about Spring Grove Avenue, the school actually started to do a really good job of putting up barriers recently in the last three years. And um, when I asked the mayor about it, I said, okay, so the school, the school property goes right to the end of Spring Grove Avenue. That's clearly not a public street. And then, um, so the school owns it up until where the barriers are, and then the police own it, you know, sort of out in the street. And it, and it is a problem because there is no enforcement possibilities. There, there isn't anyone that owns it. And I think it's the custodians that just recently started putting out the barriers and they have, to, they have to take them down for the snow. I mean, that all makes perfect sense so that people can plow. But you know, I know the guys coming over from the cemetery pull them out of the way so they can go mow the, the lawn at the school or whatever they do. So, so I think that's two things. I think I had one more. Um, let's see, of course, uh, the utilities being in the building, that was absolutely said at our meeting. Um, it was in an email now, and those plans that are signed off on don't match that. And the propane tank, the, the drawing I looked at, it was on the right-hand side. Now it's over on the left-hand side. It's really good to hear that it's going to be locked up because those kids are out there all the time. Kids are out there lying in the street. They're, you know, hanging out. They're waiting for their parents. So it's a really sort of vibrant, interesting area, but you don't want kiddos to be able to get to a propane tank that's sort of sitting there with a valve on it, um, on, not in a chain-linked area. Uh, I'm just going to take a quick look just to make sure I cover everything. Um, My understanding, um, and while you're looking that up, um, propane tank refills don't happen like monthly. They happen, I mean, how often can they expect to have a in tank? In the winter? Delivery? Depends how big the tank is. Well, I think that's the point. How yeah. big a tank? I mean, is there any indication of how often that swap might be a delivery of yeah. propane? About a handful of times a year. Is that a 500-gallon tank or a 250-gallon tank? It's, it's one of those large bullet tanks. It's a large bullet tank. Tanks that stand up vertically. Yeah, I know my experience with uh, a residential is that it was less than twice a year. Did you, is that used for cooling, too? No. Because this would be used for cooling, right? It's propane fueled heat pumps? Well, it's electronic ignition for the cooling and then propane fire for the heating system and hot water for the building. It's the only load. Mm -hmm. So the cooling is electric? Electric ignition on those systems, yeah. But the fuel source is propane? It's propane, it's magnet, yes. Mm -hmm. Do we give you enough time? Yes. <laughs> so fencing. Um, like I said, I'm here really in support of my neighbors because they get the worst of this, and I feel terrible about that. Um, although I'm glad it's not behind my house, I should say that. Um, fencing. I've been uh, looking at a variance to put um, stockade fencing up. I have stockade fencing behind my house that's six feet. But because the school is not a business, I can't by right go up to eight feet. If it was a business, I could go to eight feet. And so I'm sort of putting out there, wouldn't it be better if the, if the, instead of the chain link fence, which my, my fence is right on the chain link fence, so I assume that's the property line. I don't know why it would not be the property line down further for me. But anyway, why wouldn't they put up a, a beautiful stockade fence so that it had a little bit more, um, imper you know, so that you guys didn't have to look into the back of it. I don't know if you want that or not, but I just thought I'd put that on the, t on the table. Um, lighting we talked about, the setback we mentioned, um, yeah, and worrying about their deciduous trees that are on their property given the construction right on 13 feet away from, from their um, lot line. And um, the other locations, I just find it hard to believe that you need to spend $400,000 for two offices and then an open area for three other people. I just, I just don't think that's really... Um, financially wise, and I understand they want to put it there and all that, but it's it's open space. The the reason they're chain linking it off is because the the kids are all around there and they don't want them getting into it. The last thing I want to say is we talked a little bit earlier when you're talking about lighting and sustainability, and I just want to say the least a, a community cannot be sustainable if it doesn't bus its school kids. And part of the problem in that area is that you can't get in or out of that school 
at school close, you know, at school closing times. And so it's not under the purview of this board. But when you keep looking at things like LED lights and trying to save electricity and water and how much is going to run off from this property and it's going to be a little higher than their property, so it may actually, you know, run into their property, um, that the school bus issue is really under, you know, no community can be sustainable if you don't bus your kids because we have 140 parents that show up and pick up their kids and drop them off every day. So as you guys fix the sustainability plan, I'd really encourage you to think about school busing and what that does to any neighborhood where there's a school. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. Charge for the bus. Any other comments from the public? I hear move. Motion to close public hearing. Thank you, Tess. Second. Second by Bill. So. Can we first hear something from the applicant? Sure. Before we yes. Close, right? um, could, could I ask you to respond to the question about the noise from the HVAC units and whether they could be put inside or what your thoughts are about that? First of all, the units are, are highly efficient. Uh, we're talking 2016 technology on these units. We're not talking about uh, old, clumpy, loud units. That said, we specifically talked to the manufacturer about locating them not on the roof the way they are in a lot of modular buildings for the very reason we wanted to reduce any sound. They're quiet to start with, but we said take them off the roof. Um, I will go back to the manufacturer and discuss other options besides the sidewall mount. Uh, but again, we're not talking, this is a small space, 36 by 60 feet. So we're talking about, you know, just a couple of units on that sidewall for, to provide heating and cooling and fresh air intake into the building. So yes, we, we can go back and talk to them about it. Um, but we specifically told them in the initial designs that on the roof was not an option, even though they're quiet units to start with. Can I just ask, um, do you know what the decibel output is? Not off the top of my head, Carolyn, no. Because we do have we a stand. Have, we have all that, we'll get all that. Yeah, so I mean, yeah. basically, anything has to meet the sound standards, and the building department enforces that on, right. you, you know, generators, private property owners want to put in a massive backup generator, and those things make a lot of noise, and we've had to, as a, as a you know, in, in terms of enforcement, had to go in and ensure that those were buffered with a sound barrier so that they met the um, standards, even, the, even for the recycling test um, run. So I think that can probably be addressed. We have um, 60 decibel um, for residential units, which is a uh, residential district, sorry. So um, that would be looked at. Um, and any sort of encasement that was necessary to buffer that sound down to the allowable levels, I would imagine could be done. Mm -hmm. One other thing that you could do is shield the back side of that unit. You could ask the manufacturer if that makes any difference. Just, you know, a right. stack of concrete blocks, n no pun intended, but I mean that can make a great deal of difference with right. the sound going back. Um, and I wonder, um, it's, it's certainly not our, uh, we, we don't have an ability to straighten out the email or the conversation with the mayor. I'm, I'm happy there have been conversations ongoing with the neighborhood. I think that's how that should happen, so I want, I want to recognize <coughs> you for that. Um, and it's possible that in the description about the change, I had, I had serious water concerns about the project that I really think are addressed. I, I, was, I liked the answer I got from that, mm -hmm. and I think that running all of that roof water around might have been the answer for that's the utility that's being handled in the building. I don't know that, but you, water is a utility also, so I'm not sure maybe the question didn't get understood the same way you got the answer. Um, but I'm not surprised the unit is outside the building. Um, the mini split that... Well, yeah, it's like you can't put a condenser inside a building. Right. I mean, you've got to exhaust you know, propane. So, um, so it couldn't it couldn't go inside, or maybe a unit could go inside, but that unit would still have to have a condenser sitting outside. So, I think yeah, there may have just been misunderstanding there. I think the residential unit you ask about the mini splits are, um, you know, the technology for those that the one I'm familiar with is eight years old, and it's 
sitting right outside a window that I have open. It, it, it's my den. So I, I think there is, the, the, I understand the worry, but I'm not sure that this is the big AC unit that, that you fear. I, I understand, I certainly understand it though. I would, I'd, I'd be right here, you know, wanting to, wanting to hear answers. Um, any other questions for Dave? There was a question that came up about um, t the style of fence, you know, chain link mm -hmm. versus stockade. So I don't know if you want to, um, if that makes a difference. Do you um, well, I think that would be personal preference to the residents. Maybe they still want a, a view out, you know. So. Well, and there's there's more, uh, I feel like there's more permanence in a chain link fence than there is in a wooden stockade fence, but that's, that's something that you... I should point out that there is a stockade And that matches what's now on the school grounds. Okay. We're just relocating and expanding the length of that with the additional security gates. So has the DPW tree warden been, been involved in thinking about this? I haven't had any conversations with Rich Parcelletti yet, okay. but it's certainly on our list. Yeah. Um, I, I could not see him really evaluating the private yard trees I that seems I mean I understand that if if you were constructing close to them and and they went and demised then that would be the outcome of the of the construction but I can't see that he would come evaluate those trees but I think it is a fair question to ask mm -hmm. under the current tree replacement ordinance that we have are the trees that are coming down being replaced by the same, there is a metric for how many trees have to go back up. I uh, just wanna clarify that has not been adopted yet. And that's only for trees of a certain caliper, or di uh, DBH, DBH, so I don't know if these match that. Um, but it's not been adopted any. Aha, uh -huh. okay. But the, you know, the question about this, um, the tree warden, <coughs> um, Rich Parcelletti could, on the public side, um, potentially, I mean, you could write that in a condition that the tree um, warden has to um, um, look at the um, impacts or, or look at the site to see if separation from, if there needs to be any additional tree protection for the private side. I think you could mm -hmm. um, certainly well, have that I think done. that's the person who uh, I'm, I feel like would tell you that beyond a shadow of a doubt those trees will make it through construction or they won't. And so I think that would that would be one way where I think we've heard the residents' concerns and we've... we've uh, so my, my concern with that be is that you're having the city employee telling the city employee that his plan is good. Um, it doesn't seem to be... Um, you know, the right way of doing things uh, to get, you know, to, to be sure that you're getting an honest and unbiased opinion. Um, and I guess my concern with this project is that to me it feels very rushed um, from what I've seen of, of the looks of this building. It, it has no architectural similarities at all with the school. And frankly, it looks, you know, pretty ugly in my opinion. And if we're sitting in my backyard, I don't think I'd be too happy with it either. That said, I only I know we only have certain controls here and uh, levers we can pull, but I would really want to be sure that there is an excellent barrier, a tree barrier between that tree, between the building and the homes behind it. And I'm wondering how we can ensure that either what's being proposed is pretty much the, you know, the best we can get or is there someone that can tell us that, you know, we can actually get bigger trees and um, maybe a few more of them and so on and so forth, you know, someone maybe who's not, you know, working directly for the city or I don't know how I'd do that, but any, any suggestions there? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's, I think it's pretty soon, eight, eight foot trees upon planting are pretty substantial trees. Um, um, and I would, based on my um, knowledge and understanding of, of 
the species and other plans that have come through. I mean, you can't you can't plant trees closer than that because then they'll start dying off once they do grow because you've crammed them in too tightly. So I think these are what nine feet on center or something, um, and. You know, other trees you can plant, um, you know, closer together, but, um, you know, for instance, arborvitae, you can plant five feet on center and they grow really fast too, but um, then it becomes an aesthetic, you know, question and um, value and um, the red cedar is definitely, you know, in, uh, native to this area, so it makes sense to pick that kind of tree. Um, yeah, I guess that's just, you know, I'm looking for that type of assurance to make sure that, you know, the neighbor's interests are really being considered. Yeah, you know. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, when they go in, they'll be fairly tall, eight, eight feet. Um, and it, yes, it'll take a few years to fill in, but I think um, that's going to be with any kind of tree that you plant. To confirm, do we don't have any exterior elevations to look at? Is that right? It just no, because we're just finishing the contract phase. Oh, okay. So they're not going to generate. Their quote is based on our layout to them, okay. but the architectural plans, the engineering drawings, the foundation plan, right. that's all subsequent. I see. Okay. So those are those will be available probably in four weeks. Okay. Well, but and that's to an important. That's yeah. I mean, it's difficult to imagine approving something without. See, even seeing elevations, that's a tough thing to do for us, uh, I mean, for it, me at least. It is, although I would say that uh, since it is a pre-manufactured building, right. th they've provided a picture of what the building's going to look like because they've built that building before. So it's not, it's not an unknown. Right. True. Any other questions from the board? Uh, the new electrical transformer, <coughs> can you locate that in re relation to Spring Grove <coughs> Avenue? Look. Rachel, is there another sheet that shows Spring Grove Avenue as well as the driveway? you turn off the spring road onto the access driveway, mm -hmm. you can sort of picture that mm -hmm. in length. There were three poles on the side of the road. Okay. The utility company will be installing their transformer on the middle pole. So you probably need 50, 60 feet in at least mm -hmm. from spring Grove to that middle pole. Mm -hmm. That's also the pole mm -hmm. that the fiber optic cable that serves JFK now and the entire city in the fiber network. Mm -hmm. That's where they'll be splicing off of dropping down that same pole mm -hmm. underground over to the modular. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's not out by Spring Grove and it's, it's midway between Spring Grove and the, uh, the access parking lot. Okay. And it's all buried. It's all? Buried underground. Oh. Close. Second. Second. John. Moved by Alan, second by John. All in favor? Aye. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, board. Um, so questions and discussion among us? Um, I think it's a reasonable project. I mean, uh, unfortunately, nobody wants anything built in their backyard. I wouldn't, nobody would. But it, it seems reasonably benign. It's a considerable distance, depending on which house. It's 150 feet away, 200, 250 feet away. It's a considerable distance. Um, and the building is probably not going to be an architectural gem. We couldn't require it. The city couldn't afford it. Um, but it's some distance away. There will be this extent of screening that's reasonable 
and um, I, I think what noise, the noise probably from, as Mr. Pomerantz said, from modern um, equipment should not be excessive. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, they may hear it. I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, issues of traffic, I think, to me are non issues. Um, it's, uh, JFK is a very busy place. Bridge Road is very busy. If some people go down Spring Grove and go on to that connector when they're not supposed to, that, that's not the applicant's fault. There are only six people going to be working in the building. I think it's inconsequential. Um, so uh, I think it's reasonable. I would agree. Other opinions? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to envision this small building having an impact when you've got a school, a pool, tennis courts, basketball courts, sports fields. So, you know, I mean, I guess it's an addition, but it seems very incremental. I mean, just kind of from a practical. Well, it will standpoint. impact the people that live right behind it. I mean, they're going to see it every day, but it does seem to conform with all the rules and regulations. And um, and unless it doesn't, then I would move that we approve it. So, um, I. I I understand the confusion over the HVAC. I, I really, um, I really like to think that's not the problem you should be fearing here. I think the visually seeing the building is is the big change, and I think um, I think painting it a dark brown color. You know, I've laughed. There's a reason that all the park buildings you ever see are painted dark brown. It's because they recede and you don't see them as much. So. Um, <clears throat> can't imagine the city painting this one yellow or something that's going to be a stark problem. I'm happy to see that it's one story. Um, I do think we could discuss among ourselves some infill landscape that might solve a, a sight line in the short term that might not be that expensive by putting some bushes that are in towards the building that fill in between the trees. Um, I think that would be a, um, you know, it, it would it would just, at least for the short term, it would break up that sight line for you, and I think that landscaping would be uh, would be reasonable to ask for, and and might be a, a little bit that goes a long way is what I what I really hope for. Um, the fencing, I. I understand the request for the stockade fence, but I certainly can see the reason that, this, that the school would extend the chain link fence. And I think not having, having an assurance that the kids can't get into the propane overweights, overrides that with me. Um, there was a request for lighting to go off, and I wonder, um, um, do we need to consider anything about the lighting? It seems, uh, for our experience, this seems like a very benign lighting lighting situation. And so, um, I, if if there's no one in the building, do those exits need to be lit? Is there? Well, they're just over the entrances, though. So I'm not sure how much you'd even see that because there won't be any spillover anywhere. One's facing the school, and well, that's true. One. Side. So, let me just answer myself based on what Carolyn just said to me. So the entrance over on the school side will not get seen by the residents, no matter what happens there. And the other is towards the Bridge Street Road side, right, and which is right behind our houses. So, at a minimum, we would have a, a night sky shielded uh, fixture on that. No, that's great. Um, we we would have an, a night sky shielded fixture on that one. Yeah, and it, and it couldn't exceed the, um, the illumination levels. levels. Right. Um, so. I I mean, you could still put a condition that maybe that side entrance light has to be turned off after, you know, when the office closes, but it's also, you know, so that's going to be 4.30 for the most part, just weekdays. Yeah, I don't, I don't, if the office is closed, I don't see why that would be any um, problem to do. I'm kind of looking for a nod. And We're there at night sometimes. Well, if you are, I mean, we, we'll put the condition that if no one's in the building, the light goes off. 
and and I think that would be another nod towards it, a, a little something that I hope would would help. Um, I don't know enough about the traffic pattern on the access road. Is there any discussion that we should have about that? Uh, well, I just wanted to comment on your landscaping. Yes. Comment. I, I just don't think there's enough room to fit in bushes too. I mean, you've only got um, 13, you know, feet eight on one side, 15. Um, hopefully, I mean, you know, I, well, I can't talk to you. So, uh, <laughs> I just, and I don't think that that you could fit bushes in, and it would be probably right up against the building. And then are they going to get sunlight? And so I wouldn't recommend additional landscaping there. Um, maybe on the side towards the playing fields, you know, I don't know, because that's going to be a pretty ugly part of the buildings, kind of kind of be the backside where the mechanicals are. Um, we might consider that. Um, There's still only 10 feet, though, on that side, too, before the, you get to the fence. Before you get to the fence, I don't know if anything could be done on the outside of the fence or not. Um, again, I'm not sure it's necessary, but... Yeah, I'm, because that lot line goes over to the playing fields. I'm not worried about shielding that. I, I, mm -hmm. I could hear you speaking to me about the between that back corner that's uh -huh. uh, a little you've got a little wider angle back in that corner. Mm -hmm. um. So uh, you had a question though about uh, traffic? I just thought we ought to discuss it. I don't, I, um, it, it looks like to me that they're, they're doing what they should to keep the traffic going one way into that, right. that it is, it is serving as an access road, not as an active travel way, except when it's abused. And I think that's hopefully a limited yeah. situation. Yeah, I mean, a, a good point's raised about um, busing. Obviously we have busing, but it costs money. So I think that's the, the, the cost <laughs> that's um, come about. You know, school department decided that they need to charge for busing, so of course you're going to get people who drive instead of pay for the bus. That's nothing you guys can do about that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm looking over my list to see if there's anything that needs to get conditioned and See, at a minimum, we should see the final elevations, right? And that was one possible condition. Yeah, I mean, I guess that depends on whether you're satisfied with, you know, what you got. It's sort of the right. those the typical yeah. um, building. So yeah. it's a bit of a catch-22 because if they need they need to issue the contracts, so they're spending the m money in order to get the elevation. So. Uh, at that point, I don't see us making an opinion that would alter that. But also, right. it, it implies that if we don't like the way it looks, we're going to turn it down. And that would be an aesthetic decision that I don't think we can make and wouldn't at that point in time anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do have the ability to do that. I think they did give you, you did receive right. some better mm -hmm. information about what the building would look like. So I think it goes back to the points that if some of you already raised about the fact that it, you know, sort of is what it is, but you see that there are certain, you know, windows and the way that it's finished on the outside. Yeah, I would go back to my biggest concern for this was the water and the DPW seems to have worked that out and the design's already been reworked. Mm -hmm. Are there any DPW comments that we need to work into? Um, so the comments were really about um, that they address some, we'll, we'll get the revised plans about the drainage and the infiltration underneath, and then um, some pipe um, changing in uh, pipe size and things like that. So you could just work in to say that, you know, all the um, utility connections have to be in accordance with DPW mm -hmm. requirements. Okay. So is there a mechanism for me to ask the city to ask the designer, Berkshire Design, if they can consider adding any infill vegetation between the trees? Because um, I, I hear you, um, Carla, 
builds yeah, lots. Support that. She builds yeah. lots of things. So when she says she's oh, doubtful, I have to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean and the way that you could structure it is that um, you know that additional infill plantings um, should be located unless the landscape architect determines that it's. Um, they wouldn't survive or there's a reason they couldn't be planted in that location. Okay. And then that could be done in writing. So they have to respond in writing. Yes, we can put X, Y, and Z. No, because of whatever. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So that's one condition. Um, uh, the tree warden. Yeah, I don't have any problem with, with two sides of the city talking to each other. I think they're both doing their jobs and so I I'm confident with that there is a tree committee but the timing on getting this and he's on the committee so the, the timing of getting that seems um, well the other thing is I'm not sure how much this is I, yeah, what I, I think the public shade tree committee is about public shade trees mm -hmm. I don't know if these qualify as public shade trees yeah. no, so um, they wouldn't necessarily go through that process um, we were just looking to um, address concerns that was brought up by the public that trees on their private property would not be right damaged by the construction yeah, but there again what what if it turned out that somebody said it's possible that they could be negatively impacted well, they would what take then? you know mitigation uh, measures to, to lessen impact on the tree roots move the building I mean how if they're building no, no, it's mostly, it be the building it would be construction vehicles um, mostly um, you know not stockpiling material um, in that area things like that well those sorts of things could we just regardless require that they take reasonable method methods during construction to avoid impact but I, I don't as I said we're, they're not they can't move the building and it, again it's not about the building it's just about the construction activity well, around it so why don't we I mean is it feasible I mean, it to just put that in as activity, right? I mean, they'll lay site work. They'll, they'll, do, work. they'll do the digging and foundation work I mean mm -hmm. they're gonna um, but I think what Carl is talking about is wrapping trees or or making sure that they vehicles don't get within a certain distance mm -hmm. and I think that uh, you don't use it as a lay down area yep um, uh, you could you could you know include a condition that's prior to any site work um, that adequate tree protection measures are in place in as deemed necessary by the city's tree warden um, to protect the trees on the private property there you go. Uh, and then um, the lighting on what's the correct way to identify the the entrance south. that's on south. south south lighting will be turned off by the recreation department <coughs> when the building is not in use so those are the ones I have any other comments or things that should be noted I wish this weren't even before us. I wish that this were at the senior center. I know I said it. I know it's irrelevant. Sorry, Carolyn's like, how can you say that? <laughs> but I just, I mean, it's just a shame. It's, yeah, it's a big building and it's, we're dealing with trees and all this stuff and it's just too bad. So noted. So noted. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone want to make, uh, I'll read the conditions I have and you can use yeah. those in the motion. Um, so the ones I've noted is that the lighting on the south entrance will be turned off when the recreation department is not uh, is closed. That um, a tree warden will uh, assess the tree protection measures uh, and make sure they're in place to protect the trees. Um, and that uh, the city will uh, ask the landscape architect to uh, propose infill lower vegetation that might in the short term fill in the sight lines if uh, feasible I, I, if feasible and I'm thinking something like you or you know uh, 
I, I don't have to say. Well, what you can, can just say that unless the um, landscape architect determines that it's infeasible. Right. I'll move that we approve um, including the conditions just read. And that would be for the approval of the rec department at the middle okay. school. Do I have a second? Second. Bill seconded. All in favor? Thank you. We have one more item. Two more. One's an A and I. That. <laughs> yeah, if you can just leave it there, that'd be great. that since that code anyway that's assumed so it that doesn't have to be com commented because it's already taken care of elsewhere uh, and okay. I, so I, I think the general opinion here is that what's coming will be so far below that that we didn't it, it wouldn't even matter I, I, I feel sure of that Really? Yeah. Okay. Right. thank you okay we have an ANR and Bottom Street acceptance petition. So, so I don't know if you want me to go. I think in my staff report, I just mentioned that you guys looked, the board looked at it a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it was all, so it was in with a whole pile of other street acceptances that you were sort of reviewing and trying to get through. I don't think as much information was provided at that time about this specific. You no, know, there was some information about the history, and there's been argument. There was a couple of appeals um, to the city from the property owners on Bottoms Road. They didn't want to allow access to other people because it was their private driveway, and they didn't want other people who weren't paying, you know, to have access, etc. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but anyway, it's back. It was, the petition was brought back to the city council, which is why it's back in front of and going through this process. So remind me, we aren't countering what we did then. We then no. it was not recommended for approval. It wasn't. It wasn't in a batch, and it went forward, and then. Right. It's it's a new petition since in January. I guess it came back because it didn't. It failed to go anywhere. So what are you looking for from us? A motion to. So you need to your your you need to make a recommendation right. to city council about whether or not the city should accept um, bottom road. Well, is there an applicant? Well, anytime proponent. Is there a what? A proponent. Yeah. So anytime a, a petition <laughs> for street acceptance has to be signed by at least six residents of the city of Northampton. So, um, not necessarily on that road. Or no, it could be anywhere in Northampton. Okay. Um, so that came back to the city council as a petition at the beginning of the year. And, and do those signatories get notified that it's going to come before us? Like, um, no, it goes to city council, and then city council refers it out for comment from planning board and public works. Okay. It's not a public hearing. Right. Oh, you're just commenting so and giving a recommendation. So. They had no, yeah. what, what's our recommendation bid before? Well, it was neutral because at the time there was a lot of discussion about whether or not, you know, whether this was just a political question mm -hmm. and that's better left to city council. But there were a whole host of these. At the time, as right. I mentioned in my staff report, staff has always um, uh, felt that this is, um, that we shouldn't have a backdoor way of getting streets created. Right. And that we have subdivision roles for a reason, and that doesn't necessarily pre preclude anybody on this driveway from um, getting 
undergoing the subdivision review process and bringing this, the driveway up to a street standard and then petitioning the city. Um, this just as background for some of you who may not have been on the board when all of these streets came started coming forward um, for many years the DPW out of for whatever reason started plowing private streets um, and then um, it was made clear through several actions at the state level and then sort of filtering down that the city cannot um, plow private streets <coughs> and so that spurred this process of okay we got we have to um, we're not going to be in the business anymore of plowing people's private roads so um, then there were some streets that were really sort of in the core um, part of the city that really felt act smelled walked like a street and so for those um, you know the city um, moved rather quickly to go through the process of officially accepting those as city streets. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ones that um, actually, for whatever reason, got, um, didn't go through the exactly the proper procedure for street acceptance, but went through sort of this ad hoc, you know, 20, well, 30, maybe 40 years ago. There was an assumption that it had gone through street acceptance process, but it didn't actually fit all the criteria, didn't go through the right hearing or what have you. So those didn't count and those sort of fell to the wayside. So what I want to make clear is that when we were in that frenzy of considering all, you know, 20, 30 streets, mm -hmm. that we did not, as a, as a planning board, recommend to city council that this Bottoms Road be accepted as a street. No, you made no recommendation and there was sort of a block of streets where you said, uh, you know, this is getting, this is, this is beyond our. Right. Well, and my feeling now looking at it, sort of taking it alone out of that big group that we were considering, is that it's not up to a city street standard. Right. And why would the city take that? I recommend that we do not. Um, Recommended. Recommended. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah, I recommend recommend that we're a lot of enough right. reasons that just yeah. do I have a second? Right here. Bill seconded. All in favor of not recommending? Unanimous. Uh, and <laughs> then we'll quickly move to the last item on the agenda, which is the ANR. I move approval. <laughs> <laughs> I move to it. <laughs> this is a, another. This is another one of those um, sort of oversized lots. It's on Rust Avenue. Um, and what avenue? Rust Avenue. So going out 66, um, just past the state hospital. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, I know that one. The urban residential B district. So um, the two, the total lot size. Um, there are a couple parcels that come together, but there's only one house on it. So they're reconfiguring the property lines to have a 9,500 square foot lot and a 5,100 um, square foot lot. So both well over the minimum lot size, but um, and w the one lot would be 55 feet of frontage, which is exceeds the 50 lot minimum. And there's plenty of these. Um, 75. Can I ask if these things are just basically so mathematical, why these are coming before us and why we don't have to just make these decisions? Because the yeah. state statute says that we can't do that. I think the state it's almost, statute it's has almost. nothing to do with that. Well. So the state, the statutes say that the planning board has to agree that this is not a subdivision and nobody else can make that determination. Because no one is as smart as we are. I think well, that goes we without saying. <laughs> we, we are to ensure that the, that the staff offices are. Uh, well, I know, but they're allowed some authority. Like we, we increased their authority last week to do things. But <laughs> that seems same, much don't, don't more <laughs> elementary, <laughs> elementary than that. Do I hear a move? Uh, <laughs> you're missing. Uh, I move we. Oh no! Uh, we, uh, oh no! I thought we were making a motion to adjourn. Now it's second. second. <laughs> and Bill second. All in favor of letting Carolyn do an A and R. Now Alan has a very important motion. <laughs> to adjourn? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Second? Second. Seconded by Tess. All in favor of leaving. Because
Because it's so cold in here. Thank you for a long night. I'm always cold. That's a my jacket. I was too.